Welcome to the Wednesday, December 1st, 2021 special meeting of the Walnut Creek City Council. The City Council is conducting this meeting from the City Council Chamber and staff are complying with the current regulations of the California Department of Public Health and Cal OSHA for safe indoor meetings. As a courtesy and technology permitting, members of the public may continue to provide live remote oral public comment via the City's Zoom video conference platforming, platform. However, the City cannot guarantee that the public's access to teleconferencing technology will be uninterrupted and technical difficulties may occur from time to time. Members of the public desiring to provide comments at the meeting are encouraged to attend the meeting in person. To provide a live remote public comment, join the Zoom video conference meeting. The meeting ID is 836-6318-7906 and the passcode is 015005. When I open the public comment period, Use the raise hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only, which will alert staff that you have a public comment you'd like to provide. We ask that everyone who wishes to speak on an item, please use the raise hand feature to state your intent to speak when the item is called. If you're attending in person, please complete a speaker identification card and line up behind the lectern at the appropriate time. Please wait your turn and once brought into the meeting, state your name and city of residence for the record. Given the COVID-19 pandemic and the increased number of speakers that have wanted to make comments on various issues during our meetings and consistent with city policies related to public comments, each speaker will have two minutes to make your remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. The council will accept oral comments. Written comments submitted and received up to two hours before the meeting have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record, but will not be separately read into the record. Under California law, public comments at special meetings are limited to subjects on the agenda only, and therefore public comment will be taken during council consideration of the item. Please keep in mind this is a city business meeting, and the city council has adopted rules of decorum to ensure that meetings are conducted efficiently and effectively, and that all members of the public have a full, fair, and equal opportunity to be heard. All remarks should be addressed to the city council. Please do not use profanity during your comments. Should you choose to not provide comments but would like to view the meeting, you may do so in one of the following ways. YouTube Live, you can visit the City of Walnut Creek's YouTube channel. Cable Broadcast, Comcast Channel 28 in the incorporated Walnut Creek area. Rossmer Channel 26, Wave Channel 29, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. And it can be live streamed online on the City's website. And at this time, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And would the city clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Darling? Here. Councilmember Haskew? Here. Councilmember Silva? Here. Mayor Welk? Here. And Mayor Pro Tem Francois is absent. The second item of the agenda. Uh, as we've stated, is typically public communications, but as stated previously, under California law, public comments at special meetings are limited to subjects on the agenda only, and therefore, public comment will be taken during the council consideration of the item. Thank you all for being here this early morning for this city council meeting. And at this point, with the consideration item that we have next on the agenda, we'll receive an update regarding the organized retail theft that occurred during the evening of November 20th, 2021 and consider authorizing and sending letters to state legislators and the governor and consider authorizing additional resources to help prevent and address potential future organized retail thefts and other similar types of criminal activity. And at this time, I invite staff to provide the staff presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Dan Buckshy, city manager. And as you noted, we are here today to discuss the organi organized uh, retail theft crimes that occurred on November 20th that are obviously extremely concerning and unacceptable. And your city council scheduled this special meeting today in order to directly address this issue and to take actions that would be intended to prevent this type of activity from occurring in the future. We do have this uh, council meeting today broken into three segments. The first will be our police department, our chief, and uh, Captain Andy Brown and possibly others will be providing an update as to the events of that evening, what occurred, our response, what we did the following day, as well as this past week and future plans to not only respond to that situation, but again, to help prevent future incidences from occurring. We will also then, uh, the plan would be to take any questions from your council after that, uh, that update. 
The second portion of the meeting is we will discuss the proposed letters to be sent to our state legislators, to our governor, as well as the letter that was previously sent to our district attorney in Contra Costa. And then the third update after taking questions on that portion would be to discuss recommended resources to help address this situation in the future. So that is the plan for this morning. And one thing I want to touch base on before we dive into the update from our police chief and police department is it's important to identify and keep in mind our roles in jurisdiction as a city and as a police department and what our roles more specifically uh, as they relate to the overall criminal justice system. So our police department has responsibility for enforcing existing laws, preventing crimes to the extent possible, and doing so by patrolling and then obviously investigating crimes and making arrests. And that's what we have that jurisdiction within the city limits primarily. We then must rely on others who have roles in the criminal justice system. That includes our district attorney who has responsibility for pressing charges and prosecuting crimes. Our county sheriff's department that runs the jail and houses those who have been arrested or sentenced. The court who sets bail and ultimately would uh, conduct the trial and if anyone is found guilty, um, determine sentencing. And all of these folks and all of these departments and operations, how those roles and responsibilities are handled impacts our police department's ability to prevent crime. And so it's important as we work through this to keep in mind our various roles and responsibilities. And then lastly, your city council's primary role with respect to police activity is to oversee the budget and the allocation of resources as you see fit. And that's part of what we'll be discussing here today. So that concludes my, my initial introduction this evening. You'll be hearing, or this morning rather, uh, you'll be hearing more from me later. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to our police chief. Thank you very much and good morning, honorable mayor and members of the city council. I wanna let everybody know today that what happened at Nordstrom on November 20th amounted to several serious crimes and a brazen display of criminal behavior. We will keep investigating these crimes to bring the rest of these offenders to justice. So I also wanna thank some of our regional partners who have been very supportive uh, from the onset of this and in the days following. I wanna recognize our district attorney, Becton, who's here today. Thank you so much for being here. The U.S. Marshal's Office and U.S. Marshal Don O'Keefe, uh, Sheriff David Livingston of the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office and Assistant Sheriff Steve Simpkins, who's joining us by Zoom, I believe. Thank you for being here. And Assistant S Special Agent in Charge Scott Shovel and the FBI. Also, the Executive Director Mike Cena from the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center. All of these organizations have reached out to us offering their full support as we continue to investigate these crimes. And lastly, I wanna thank the men and the women of the Walnut Creek Police Department who have been working tirelessly since the 20th to bring a sense of safety to our city, especially in the downtown area. They've been working a lot of uh, long hours and we really appreciate it. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our operations division commander, Captain Andy Brown, who's gonna give us an update on the events on November 20th and the days following. Thank you, Chief. Good morning, Mayor, City Council members, members of the community. Good morning, Mayor, City Council members, members of the community. Thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it is my honor to serve you all uh, as the police captain for Walnut Creek Police Department in charge of the operations division. Um, to start the update, I want to share with you what information was known uh, prior to the incident and what was not known prior to the incident. Um, at 8.41 p.m., the chief received information of the potential for an organized retail theft in the East Bay. Neither Walnut Creek nor a specific store was mentioned and, and there was no additional information. The chief shared this information with me and I reached out to my special events unit commander to attempt to gather more details. Within four minutes of the chief's text to me, Nordstrom was burglarized by an organized and coordinated group of, of criminals. Uh, before we discuss the incident in detail, I also wanna share uh, with you our patrol staffing just prior to the incident. 
So at 8.45 p.m., we had 11 units on duty, six patrol officers, one reserve officer uh, who was volunteering their time as a police officer, uh, a uh, officer assigned to the Apple store on an overtime basis, two sergeants and one lieutenant. And at that time, at 8.45 p.m., four officers were on calls for service uh, in, the, in the area. One officer was assigned to the Apple store, as mentioned before, and three officers were available for calls for service. Uh, one of those officers was in the downtown area. One was at the Corp Yard, which is uh, basically the Lawrence Way 680 northbound on-ramp area. And another, another officer was at the police department. And we also had two sergeants and one lieutenant on at that time. So to give you the sequence of events and the response to the organized retail theft at Nordstrom on November 20th, um, I'll start at 8.45 again. So 8.45 p.m., Sergeant Goudinas, who was working at the Apple store on overtime, heard vehicles honking on Broadway Plaza, and he advised over the radio he was going to investigate. At 8.46 p.m., dispatch received a report of four cars driving recklessly on North Main Street and Bonanza Street. At that same time, 8.46 p.m., Sergeant Goudinas observed multiple vehicles driving in reverse on Broadway Plaza, and none of the vehicles had license plates. Realizing a crime was occurring, he attempted to stop the vehicles, but they did not yield. Sergeant Goudinas then positioned his patrol vehicle, positioned his patrol vehicle at the entrance to Broadway Plaza and Mount Dapple Boulevard, attempting to block the vehicles from leaving the area. He exited his vehicle and observed Officer Hamid at Broadway and Mount Dapple Boulevard near one of the suspect vehicles. Sergeant Goudinas advised Officer Hamid to stop the vehicle he was near. Officer Hamid gave commands to the driver of the vehicle to turn his car off while pointing his firearm at the driver. Sergeant Goudinas and another officer arrived to assist Officer Hamid in taking the driver and passenger into custody. During a search of the passenger, an officer recovered a loaded firearm. At 8.48, while officers were detaining the two suspects, the Nordstrom manager called dispatch to report a large grab and run which had just occurred. During the investigation, it was learned that approximately 90 subjects entered the store simultaneously through the north, northwest, and southwest doors and proceeded to grab large quantities of merchandise. Some of the subjects, some of the subjects used hammers to smash display cases to access the contents within. The suspects physically assaulted three employees, including a female employee who was kicked and punched by a male suspect. This same suspect also pepper sprayed an employee. A different suspect brandished a knife at a fourth employee. In, to in total, the criminal mob was in and out of the store in less than one minute before fleeing in their waiting, waiting vehicles parked haphazardly along Broadway Plaza and Mount Diablo Boulevard. In total, the organized criminal activity resulted in approximately $86,000 in merchandise loss, mostly clothes, perfume, and handbags, and $37,000 in damage to the store. At 8.49 p.m., while officers were arresting two, sus uh, two theft suspects, another officer responded to the area and observed multiple vehicles fleeing at a high rate of speed. The officer attempted to stop one of the vehicles, which resulted in a pursuit southbound on South Broadway at speeds of 90 miles per hour. The officer ultimately terminated the pursuit due to public safety concerns. Uh, by 8.50 p.m., all available units were in the downtown area except two officers who were on a traffic collision call at La Casa Villa and Ignacio Valley Road. By this time, it appeared all the suspects had fled the area except for the two that we had arrested. Um, so in summary, from the moment Sergeant Godinez went to investigate the honking horns on Broadway Plaza until the incident was over, it was only five minutes had passed. Um, you know, in, in fact, you know, our officers were engaged in arresting two suspects simultaneously with the call from Nordstrom that the crime had occurred. Um, so our response was, was immediate and, and really contemporaneous with the actual incident itself largely because we had an officer stationed at, at Apple Store um, and then one officer very close by. Um, from that point on, uh, officers were um, patrolling the area and at 9.20 p.m. 
came in contact with three subjects in the area related to a parked vehicle on North Main Street and Mount Dabble Boulevard. Two of the suspects fled on foot while officers detained and arrested a, a third suspect and stolen property from Nordstrom was located and recovered inside the parked vehicle in which they were near. So in total, uh, there were three suspects arrested on the night of the event, November, November 20th. Um, we called in the members of the Investigations Bureau to take over the investigation, and we are in the process of identifying other involved subjects. Uh, we've got significant um, you know, private and, and, uh, and public surveillance cameras to review, and there's a lot of video, and we're hoping to identify uh, more than just the ones that we've arrested so far. Uh, we also called out additional officers to provide a highly visible police presence downtown, and during the remainder of the night, officers patrolled the downtown area, uh, but nothing of significance occurred. So that was uh, November 20th, uh, the incident and the response, and now I want to talk about what our response was the following day on Sunday, November 21st. Uh, we called in additional staffing to provide a highly visible police presence and to serve as a deterrent. Uh, we had four police reserves that came in and seven officers came in on overtime to support uh, the patrol officers already working that day. Uh, they spent most of their time in the downtown area uh, on foot in vehicles being a highly visible presence. We coordinated with the Public Works Department regarding placement of barricades to block off Broadway Plaza from vehicle traffic. Uh, we, communicated with our, we communicated our approach with Walnut Creek downtown and area businesses. We alerted our law enforcement partners to be on standby in case a similar event occurred. We reached out to our county's mutual aid mobile field force leadership, BART PD, CHP, Pleasant Hill PD, and Concord PD. Up until 6 p.m. on Sunday, it was a relatively normal Sunday in the downtown area. We didn't have any information that any similar event was going to happen. And then at 6 p.m., we obtained information regarding a Home Depot in Oakland, which was just a target of a theft by more than 20 subjects and a caravan of vehicles. At 6.08 p.m., we obtained information regarding a, a mall in Hayward had been a target of theft by a group of people. At 7.33, we obtained information, obtained information from uh, Santana Row, San Jose, regarding a theft of um, items there. At 8.47, we obtained information regarding a caravan of approximately 200 vehicles in Oakland. And at 8.52, we obtained information that approximately 100 vehicles were on Monument Boulevard in Pleasant Hill and engaged in sideshow activity. Uh, at that point, our officers were de uh, deployed to the highway exit ramps and access points to Walnut Creek in case the group decided to come into town. Ultimately, the caravan of vehicles drove west on Highway 24 away from Walnut Creek. Now that, I, now that I have provided you an update on the organized retail theft of Nordstrom and the response the following day, I um, kind of want to give you an idea of what our law enforcement strategy has been since and leading through the holiday season. So our goal is to prevent and deter these types of crimes through vigilance, a highly visible police presence, and active enforcement. Officers have been directed to take a zero tolerance approach to license plate violations, especially in the downtown area. This is in response to the tactic employed by suspects who remove their license plates while they commit these types of brazen crimes. We're also adding staffing during peak periods on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And last weekend, we increased our staffing significantly in the downtown area. Going forward, we plan to add six officers daily to our current patrol staffing, staffing and we hope to accomplish this by utilizing our resource, sorry, utilizing our reserve officers as a resource, uh, filling overtime positions and by assigning detectives to work in a uniform capacity on occasion. I will note that, a high, that having a highly visible police presence at or near a high, va high value target does not tend to deter, uh, sorry, does tend to, to deter crime, and at the very least, it displaces crime. Since 2019, the Apple Store has not experienced a grab and run of merchandise while a Walnut Creek PD officer has been posted there on overtime. Cl clearly, small groups of of uh, who typically commit these grab and runs. Um, they're usually smaller groups that do these grab and runs, and there's no guarantee that one cop posted in a specific location would be able to stop a group of 80, op 80 suspects from engaging in organized 
uh, an organized criminal mob swarm and grab style theft. However, the goal is to deter or displace these types of crimes through presence and target hardening. One target hardening method already employed is closing Broadway Plaza to vehicular traffic through the holiday season. Through coordination with public works, road barricades and signage have been erected to make it more difficult for a criminal mob to execute a similar swarm and grab strategy. Um, other components of our law enforcement strategy include consistently communicating with our business partners in a timely manner to share information and discuss target hardening options. Uh, also consistently communicating and coordinating with our regional law enforcement partners to include the FBI, the U.S. Marshal's Office, CHP, the Contra Costa, Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office, and the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center. The need to share immediate information across the region is essential as these highly mobile groups have shown a willingness to strike multiple locations when active. Uh, this morning at 10 a.m., Walnut Creek PD is hosting an organized retail crime meeting consist consisting of law enforcement and business partners from throughout the Bay Area. This is a great opportunity to share information on what is working in other jurisdictions so we can tailor our approach uh, if necessary. Um, that is the update. So thank you for your time and giving me an opportunity to provide an update on the significant and cowardly act committed, committed by an organized group of selfish and entitled individuals who have no respect for the law or regard to public safety. Thank you, Captain Brown. Let me just add a couple of uh, additional comments to build on what uh, Captain Brown just noted in the update to give you a sense of the broader coordination within the city. Uh, several of us on the executive team who also serve in emergency uh, director and emergency management roles were in close contact with the chief and others in PD and as was noted, but I do want to highlight our, our public works uh, folks were activated and we had uh, vehicles that were loaded with barricades should um, roadways need to be closed uh, to help with this event or potential future events. We also had plywood that was loaded on vehicles should there be a need to board any facilities if this grew larger in size. And I will share with you that evening on Sunday when we heard about the Pleasant Hill Sideshow and some of the other intel that had come in, uh, the chief and I had a back and forth discussion about uh, whether or not we should consider boarding up and putting word out to do that. Ultimately decided not to and it worked out, but uh, it was a, a key decision point. In addition, our city attorney drafted a curfew notice should it need to be put in place. That's something we did not want to pursue and glad we did not have to do so, but I want you to know that that was on cue and ready to be implemented should, they, should, have this, should the situation have grown worse. So there was a lot of uh, activity amongst others and obviously your council was briefed and uh, up to date and, and taking many calls from the media as well. So I do want to thank uh, not only our police department and all of our officers, dispatchers and others for all of their diligence, especially over a holiday weekend, but also many of our other city employees who have been actively involved. And with that, I believe we are available for questions. Unless there's anything else you wanted to add, Chief? Great. Thank, thank you, uh, Dan, Chief, and Captain Brown. Uh, and actually, if I, that reminds me if I could ask everybody in the room to silence their phones. Uh, so let's bring it to council for questions that we are asking at this point of the police department. We'll get to other law enforcement areas afterwards. So let's start with uh, council member Darling. Thank you, and thank you for your report. I really appreciate all that you guys have done in response to this incident. Um, kind of had a couple different questions. Some I've got from friends of mine in law enforcement, some from social media, and some were just general questions. Um, relative, some people have asked me what should they do if they're out downtown and they see something that looks suspicious, a license plate that's got tape on it or something like that. What do you recommend people look for and how do you recommend they react if they see something like this happen? Well, let, let's talk about the, the actual event. If, if there's an event like this, um, my direction to the public is to get away from the area and call us. Mm -hmm. Um, with regards to suspicious, um, you know, vehicles without, uh, you know, covering their license plates, things like that, um, it never hurts to call us. Um, we have, we're here 24-7, um, so we, we want that information, and the more we get, the better. Uh, in this case, you know, someone did call, 
and said there was vehicles driving recklessly, that's helpful because that's, when you have a group of vehicles like that doing that, that's unusual, right? One, one reckless vehicle, okay. But um, six in a row. Exactly. Yeah. So call us. Okay. And then um, besides closing down Broadway Plaza, are there any other physical modifications downtown or um, in Broadway Plaza that would help harden it to deter future robberies? Are you still looking at that? We're still evaluating options. Um, again, this is some of that property is, is uh, private property, so we have to coordinate with the, the businesses with regards to um, target hardening options. Just to clarify, you're talking about Broadway Plaza Drive. Yes, yes. Not closing Broadway Plaza. We are not closing Broadway Plaza. That would be very sad. Um, and then with the technology we have in town with license plate readers, do they have the ability to detect that somebody doesn't have a license plate or are they just looking for that number? Yeah, my understanding is is right now we don't have the ability to um, see that, but there are there is technology out there that quite possibly will have that capability mm -hmm. uh, built into the algorithm of the, of that camera. Okay, and then are there any additional locations? Are you looking at um, to potentially deploy license plate readers? Yes, we're, we're always looking for um, the best kind of access points, ingress egress points. Um, we have several throughout the city, but um, the more that we have, the better that we're going to be able to, you know, identify and, and, and follow that, that flow through the city. And then as far as the caravans on the highways, is there a way to detect those given the amount of technology we have out there, or is that something that could be looked into also? Uh, maybe the, the chief would want to speak to this, but I know Highway 4 has a pretty robust camera system mostly in re uh, as a result from uh, a grant that the DA's office uh, obtained regarding shootings that were happening on Highway 4. I don't know the, the parallels and the, the correlation of whether that would be useful on Highway 24, for instance, uh, 680, and whether we could use that for to identify these types of mass um, you know, caravans of cars. So that's like the shot spotter technology. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, Council Member Darling. There, the Eastern Contra Costa Regional Freeway Security Network does exist. Uh, there is a, an MOU between several different cities. We were not involved in that, but my understanding is there's shot spotter technology, ALPR technology, and multiple camera systems. Uh, we may reach out to them to find out if we could also partner with them to leverage that technology to help us. Thank you. Um, and it sounds like you're working hard on the information sharing between the different law enforcement agencies. Is that something that's going to be regularized from here going forward? Or? Um, it, it is a regular occurrence. Uh, we could always get better at information sharing. And really, the importance is the timeliness of the sharing of information. Mm -hmm. So you know, these groups can, can be at one area and 20 minutes later be at another area. Um, and get throughout the Bay Area very quickly, and we need to sh we need to, we need to know that we need to share that information uh, because if it happens in Pleasant Pleasanton, it could happen in Walnut Creek, it happens in San Francisco or Emeryville. Um, it just a, it could be a matter of time before they try to come to Walnut Creek. Yeah, this, the speed of this is astounding. How fast it turns over. Um, this is one that I got I saw several times repeated on social media that there was some sort of order across Walnut Creek PD to stand down, to not interact, you know, interact with anybody during an organized robbery like this. Can you speak to that? That is not accurate. Um, and as, as evidenced by our response in the moment, um, we did take two people in custody in the middle of, of that, um, that incident. And it was very chaotic. I'm sure people have seen the videos that have been posted online. Um, I've seen some of the body-worn camera video so I know what was going on at that time. Um, and in that moment, our officer did an excellent job uh, taking an armed suspect into custody, um, two suspects at that, at that time, and um, in a very challenging situation. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure that people understood. Can I just follow up on that real quick, sure. Council Member? So during COVID, many police departments had to adjust their policing strategies just for the safety of the public and for the officers who were essential workers and still going to work and, and patrolling the streets 24-7. So we did make some adjustments 
on our proactivity and really just looked at essential calls for service just for the safety of everyone. Now that we're hopefully coming out of the, the COVID era, if you will, um, we have made several adjustments to our policing activity. So you will see more patrol activity. You will see more traffic stops. We're also taking a zero tolerance approach on vehicles who do not display license plates so that we can send a strong message. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Um, I think that's my questions for you and I really appreciate your efforts on this. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Council Member Haskew. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, the, the, let me find them on my, <coughs> on my notes. Um, the, the first question is, <clears throat> um, wh what my husband has told me as a military person is um, when, when somebody is wounded, that's better for the enemy than killing somebody because the, the, the team that's had their wounded person takes care of their wounded person, so that takes out two or three people. I'm going to analogize this to um, when you only have a few officers um, who can be ready in just moments. Um, is there any decision about whether you try and contain or whether you try and, uh, and, and make sure that less damage happens? How do you make the choice between how you deploy? Well, well, we'll look at this instance, right? So our officers decided to um, engage and try to take suspects into custody immediately. Um, there was no waiting around. There was no um, um, hesitancy by our officers. And that's what we expect uh, when, when a situation like this occurs. Um, definitely we want to call in additional resources and that, that's why we have the radio and we let everyone know what, what is happening. Uh, but the reality is when we contact, if we contact one person, we always want to have a numbers advantage. We always want to have an officer and a cover officer. If we contact three people, we need to have another officer. So we always want to be an advantage in terms of the contact for officer safety purposes, for public safety purposes. And um, so as you can imagine, if we're contacting two people and one has a gun, um, we're going to need at least three officers on that call and p most likely more than that uh, to, to resolve it quickly. Um, and once they're in custody, then we can kind of uh, divert resources from that standpoint. Um, but I think I answered your question in terms of... Yeah, except yeah. I, contact means you were, you were in the process of assessing whether they needed to be arrested or not. Is that what lay language would say contact means? The, the purpose at that point was detaining them for their involvement in a likely criminal activity that was happening at that time. Okay. And then the arrest w w followed. So when, when we were talking about the people coming down the highways to get here... Um, did did the CHP notice, Does do we know if the CHP noticed a lot of people driving with no license plates, or did they remove the license plates when they got here? I, I don't have an answer for you with regards to that. Or did you? No, uh, I don't believe CHP was aware of that. Uh, CHP did reach out to me that evening after the fact just to offer their support and, and put additional units in the area, but there's... Uh, I, and I don't know if we could leverage technology in the future like this freeway camera network to actually detect that. If there's a group of cars with no license plates, that would be a huge precursor that would allow us to at least scramble some units and get them in the area. Uh, one thing we did do, I think Captain Brown mentioned that when the sideshows were going on in Pleasant Hill, we did put officers at off ramps and on ramps just to have a presence there. Um, so that would be helpful to know. Uh, and hopefully in the future, if that is noticed, whether it's by the member, a member of the public or CHP, we would get uh, notice of that. Okay. And my final question is, this is a group of 90, 80 to 90 people, depending on whose estimate you want to use. Um, are, do, do we have any guess as to whether they are known to each other? This is like a 90 people um, crowd or that get together regularly and figure out how to do this or is it more complex than that there's there is some indication that there could be possible gang activity involved in some of these groups 
Um, it's unknown if this is one specific group or multiple groups. They're certainly using a very clandestine way of communicating. So uh, one of the things that we do is we partner with uh, you know, our, our regional law enforcement agencies and, and NICRIC, uh, the Northern California uh, Regional Intelligence Center, to share this information. Uh, the following day after the 20th, I spoke with the executive director, Mike Sina, and we talked about strategies on real-time information sharing. So we are looking at other technology and ways that we can get, the, get that information real, as real-time as we can. Thank you. Councilmember Silva. Thank you very much, Mayor. And thank you, um, Chief and Well, I'm looking at his mask and I'm thinking, I can't remember yeah. your rank. No, I know your name's Andy Brown. <laughs> but, you know, somehow the, the sign that says captain is not visible from here. Um, and captain, and to the entire police department and all of our city staff for what you did to respond that evening as quickly as you did. It was frightening. I was in Seattle and we get the text message and I'm looking at video of it thinking, who took this video and how close were they willing to stand in the middle of an officer, two officers, it was what it looked like, um, basically containing and arresting some suspects. So thank you for your work. It's, um, you put your lives on the line for all of us, but also it's very frustrating not to be able to stop it. I can't imagine. <clears throat> For those of us who like taking action and achieving results, this was, you know, a frustrating result. The um, a couple of questions. I think the staffing equation is what's really not understood well enough by the public, because you see a lot of comments. Well, they should have just arrested all of them. So I'm going to do the math here. If it takes um, two to arrest one and three to arrest two, if you've got 80 to 90, my math says you're getting close to 200 officers necessary in order to arrest them in a minute and a half. Am I that's, exaggerating or that's being correct. funny here? It's probably low, but yes, that's, that's I'm, right. I'm being, yeah. see, I was trying to be conservative. <clears throat> okay, how many officers do we have, sworn officers do we have on staff? Uh, today we have 74. 74. In a 24 by seven operation, you said there were 11 on duty that Saturday night. Is that, what is our average staffing on a Saturday night? That's pretty equivalent to our average staffing. Okay. <clears throat> and how long does it take to get the rest of the 57, 56, 55 into position and on the job given where everybody lives? It could take hours or days if they're in Seattle yeah. like I was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the likelihood of being able to actually corral this, control it, and stop it at the moment it's happening is slim to none. Correct, and that's why prevention is the key. Exactly. For presence. So I was trying to figure out where the, let me just like slightly change. Where were the 25 cars? I mean, that's what it's been estimated. It seems like 25 cars, on Broadway Plaza Street and Mount Diablo would basically be a parking lot. It basically was a parking lot. They, so they, an officer trying to get to the scene from four blocks away in a vehicle is having to park at the end of the parking lot. Um, well, you, Sergeant Godina has got out of his vehicle and to assist Officer Meade. So yes, th and there, was, there was no way to get from point A to point B in that confined area, the kind of that one or two block area. So you have I a just, really bad visual from a movie is what I'm... Uh, uh, these are important points, Captain Brown. If you could just make sure that you're speaking loud enough and into the mic, I, I think everybody's going to want to hear these answers. Sorry about that. So basically, once that crowd came in and created an effective parking lot, there was no way to get to them quickly in a, in a city police vehicle or any other vehicle. You had to get out of the vehicle and move through that crowd. That's what our officers did. They parked from a distance away and then got out of their vehicle. Okay, exactly. Thank you. Um, can, can I ask a absolutely. Further, further question? So if we had put the entire police department in that, that area, we would have left the rest of the city uncovered. Is that a fair statement so that 
so that a really great criminal mind could arrest, could start another thing in a different direction? Do we have to remain alert and protective of the rest of the city while something is going on like this? Yes, of course we do. And you know, one thing I want to mention is, as soon as we make an arrest, that takes an officer off the street for anywhere from three to four, sometimes five hours. And we're not talking just paperwork, we're talking about transporting the arrestee to the detention facility, where right now, as far as we've been told and our research shows, our wait times are up to three hours. So that takes an officer off the street for three hours, and we do have 22 square miles to patrol. So if you have one critical incident on one side of the city that could tie up two or three officers and something else that happens at the other side of the city, using doing the math, you can see quite quickly we can uh, be at a real need for additional resources. Thank you. So let's go to our friends in our other communities, um, Pleasant Hill, Concord, Danville, Lafayette, Mutual Aid. I know that we're always on call for each other. How long does it take them to be able to respond in a crisis like this? You know, ideally minutes, um, depending on where they're coming from. There could be a Contra Costa County deputy in the, in the area. They do patrol parts of Walnut Creek, unincorporated Walnut Creek. Um, obviously, Pleasant Hill and Concord are close, but depending on where their units are coming from, that could take 10, 15, 20 minutes, depending on traffic. It's, it's not immediate. So the, basically, in a situation like this that happens in literally, I'm looking at five minutes, and then they're on the roads at 90 miles an hour getting to a freeway on or off ramp that is six blocks away, because which was what, one of the reasons why Walnut Creek is ideal for basically being a retail shopping hub and a retail shopping crime hub is because the off ramps and on ramps are so close by. The CHP doesn't have the kind of staffing that could support us with 10 to 20 additional officers in a nanosecond, does, does it? No, they do not. No, I don't know exactly how many units they have in any given area, but just like us, they get overwhelmed too. If they get one vehicle accident on Highway 4 or busy highway, depending on traffic, they, mean, they may need multiple units to help direct traffic and just to make that scene as safe as possible. So there are limited resources, but this is a good area. We have a lot of uh, regional partners that uh, we routinely call on for mutual aid, and we also provide that to our sister cities in the area and the county. Um, and I just want to mention the sheriff reached out to me personally and offered to put a sheriff's deputy uh, in our downtown area over the next uh, few weekends just to help us out with extra patrols. So we do have a good network um, of partners in the area that have been very supportive. So can we talk about the traffic cameras, the program that's in Highway 4 in East County, and just to get some clarity on that. Traffic cameras my recollection when we approved them in the past, are really about post-event investigations, not about preventing crime because you can see it coming at you as if they were flying planes for an hour and you can see them coming. That's partially true. Uh, a lot of the investigations that we're able to um, solve, we're able to do it because we, we get good video evidence from some of these traffic cameras. However, if the camera does have ALPR technology attached to it, then we would get near real-time uh, notifications or a hit on a wanted vehicle. What we are exploring, and we do have a demo scheduled with a vendor who specializes in machine learning and algorithms for vehicle detection and research. Uh, so we are looking at what technology is available to leverage that to get real-time updates if, if it can detect something specific like a group of cars driving erratically. So the technology is out there. Uh, we just have to explore um, you know, if it would be available to us and what that would actually look like. But to your point, um, a majority of what we use the cameras for is after the fact investigations and follow-up, and they've been very valuable. So this AOPR, whatever that stands for, automated? License op plate reader. Optical, okay. Um, so if that technology could tell us something was 
happening that we didn't like, erratic behavior of five cars. Somebody has to get that warning. Does it come so in, to, yeah, so in City Hall into dispatch or something like that? Yeah, it comes through a secure network into our comm center or uh, dedicated terminals that receive those hits. So the camera system that's on Highway 4, Pittsburgh, Antioch, that was really more to get investigative information about shootings, not to see shootings happening at the time, or is it both? Both. There's real-time data that they get via shot spotter technology and uh, the other technology that they have. Is that right. technology basically hardwired on the system in East County, or can it be transferred here in three days? Uh, it's both. My understanding is that they have both hardwired uh, equipment and also wireless technology. So it could be de redeployed or access? That's possible. We're, we're certainly interested in exploring that. So using all this camera investigation post-incident, do we know where the cars came from and how long it took 80 car, uh, 25 cars to basically get here? Do we have any inclination? Did they all come off the off-ramp on Mount Diablo at the same time, or were they queuing up over a period of time? Well, we do have a limited location of cameras in the city, and not all of them are working right now, so we're trying to address that as well. Uh, and we're, we'll st we're still sort of you know, collating all of this information and data to look at video evidence to kind of put the pieces together. But right now our main focus is just identifying the suspects and bringing them to justice. And my one last question, you've been very patient, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, in 2020, in May, when we had the incidents, they, we, we were discovering what I will call caches of um, potential weapons that had been stashed in different locations around the community. Have we gone and looked for that, or is this a different type of behavior such that it's just a crowbar and a gun? Not just. Remove that adjective. <laughs> it is, oh no, a crowbar. A cr crowbars and guns. My assessment of the looting that took place in 2020, that was more of a well-organized effort where this is more of a spontaneous um, coordinated attempt um, where, where they might not necessarily have a plan in place like they did in 2020, but they have enough people communicating back and forth and just basically following the leader, if you will, in a pack of cars to go on to the next location. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for your patience. Yep. Nope. Thank you. I think these are, all, these are all important questions. I know some of these are going to get more detailed than others, but I think this is an issue where everybody's paying attention to this, and this is going to also help other departments, too. So uh, I'm going to apologize in uh, advance for the questions I have, some of which are my own, some of which are also from the community. I've, as you can imagine, I've received a lot of emails, and there's a lot of postings, and I want to make sure that the answers are at least addressed publicly on this. I did want to quickly ask regarding the cameras themselves. You'd mentioned that several, several of them aren't working. Are these cameras that identify with, that there are stolen vehicles that are coming into or out of the city? Are we notified when that happens? I know for, we have our LPRs. Yeah, I'm not sure what auditing system we have in place, but we're working with Public Works to figure that out. We, we of course, want the technology working. My understanding is there's some uh, hardware issues that uh, need to be addressed, some wiring, cabling, and conduit issues that need to be addressed at a couple of the locations, but we are working on that. Okay, so you, do you know how many cameras aren't working as of now, or is that still being determined? Captain Brown, can you speak to that? Roughly, approximately 12 or 15. Okay, well, later we're discussing cameras as well, so we'll bring this up then too. Uh, some of these questions have been asked, so I'm just quickly going through these. Uh, uh, and I apologize if I, if I missed the answer to this, but why was the very first car stopped just prior to all of the activity happening when we, when we had the two occupants in the car? It wasn't prior. That was during. That was right at the beginning. Right, right, yeah, right at the beginning. Um, Sergeant Godinez observed the, the the parking lot of vehicles in the middle of the roadway, some vehicles driving in reverse. Um, he recognized that this was probably a targeted, you know, retail theft. 
um, and he, he was investigating. So that that's the reason for for those stop. And at the same time, uh, you know, the Nordstrom manager called dispatch, and they're putting out that information that the grab and run had just occurred. So all this is kind of happening mm -hmm. in real time. Um, but initially, Sergeant Godinez went to investigate just honking, you know, horns on Broadway Plaza, but, ex you know, excessive and unusual. Um, so that's what brought his attention that, that direction. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I could just clarify one mm -hmm. thing. So as far as our, our traffic cameras go, many of those cameras are used for signal detection, but we are also able to pull video evidence when needed. And many of those cameras are certainly working. We just have a few that need to be addressed. And if you want specific numbers, I could certainly provide that to the council later. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Uh, there, uh, so some community members, visitors, um, have some questions as well. I just want to make sure that these are all addressed. Are the police officers' hands tied to not allow them to do the job? No, they're not. Have the, has the council or city management or city staff in any way held, you, held the police department down from doing the job to protect the safety of everybody that lives here, works here, or visits here? No, you have not. Can officers shoot out tires or put out tire strips to flatten tires during these activities? Uh, so we do have some technology, um, spike strips, that could be deployed when there's time, um, and the, the circumstances will allow. Um, as far as shooting out tires, that's not something that we that we train on or do. Um, uh, th there could be instances where that drastic measure could be employed, but not with regards to this past incident. Um, I'm talking about, you know, a murder suspect who uh, potentially is going to ram, via, you know, ram uh, pedestrians, that kind of thing. So I, I don't want to say blanketly we don't do that, but we would not do it in this case. Okay, thank you. Uh, can officers spray paint suspected cars or thieves as they leave in order to identify them later? Uh, we don't have that ability. Uh, we do have some uh, ability to um, put a, a tracker on a vehicle given a specific distance to that vehicle. Um, it's uh, technology that allows us to really avoid going into a pursuit with a vehicle because that that activity is inherently dangerous to the public uh, and all involved, um, the idea would be to track that vehicle to its final destination and then start the investigation at that point. Okay, thanks. Uh, I want to expand a little bit upon what Councilmember Silva had asked. Uh, can you walk us through the process of what happens from the time a suspect is arrested to the handoff at county jail? Okay, so um, our officers will obviously search the subject search the vehicle, identify all the applicable crimes that were committed, the charges that we're going to re request. Um, there is a arrest booking form that our officer completes on the, the, the computer in the vehicle. Uh, the subject is transported to Mar Martinez detention facility. Um, and in recent past, there's just been a significant amount of time that that our officers are there in Martinez waiting to have the, the prisoner processed and booked into uh, the county jail. And that's, that time frame is nothing that we can impact. Um, we have to wait in line. If uh, another agency brings in five prisoners in a, in a van ahead of us, we've got to wait for, them, for those five to be processed, and then it's our turn. So it's just kind of a queue uh, situation there. So it takes an officer off the streets for three to four to five hours, whatever it is. Exactly. Okay. Uh, and, and, and the last question here is really just to allow you, perhaps this is best for, uh, for Chief Knox, is some people have written and commented that they're afraid to come to Walnut Creek now and shop, and they're afraid to come downtown. What would you say to those people and to everybody? Well, if you look at crime in our city, you know, some of the events that have happened over the last, you know, four months since I've been here, 
they're all isolated incidents. It's not to say that we don't have crime here. We certainly do. Is our crime rate low? I think that's subjective. Um, it's not as low as other cities this size, but it's certainly not as high as other similar sized cities. So we, we try to do our best to create a sense of public safety uh, at all times, especially in our downtown area, because so many people frequent that area, not just during the day, but also in the evening hours to shop and dine. I believe, based on my experience and working for five different municipalities now, that this is a very safe city and our police department does a very good job at keeping our cities, uh, city safe. But at the end of the day, when you have a, a destination city like Walnut Creek, a lot of people come here, and quite frankly, criminals come here too because they want to go where the nice stuff is and um, try to victimize uh, people who are here. And, but what, I would, what I, I would reassure everyone is that we are very um, committed to creating a safe environment, not only in downtown, but th throughout the entire city. And we will continue to do that under my watch. And I just don't think there's any reason for anybody to feel unsafe. Uh, these were isolated incidents and it's very, and it is a safe community. Thank you, Chief. Uh, let me ask uh, one last time for the council if there's any other questions for the police department at this point. Seeing none. Um, Dan, did you want to say something? Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. So that'll. I think this uh, this uh, <laughs> moves on from the police department at this point. So next, uh, we will look at the next part of the staff presentation. All right. Good morning again, Dan Buckshai, City Manager. In this section, we're going to discuss the proposed letters that uh, be sent to our partners at the regional and state level, and let me discuss each of these in a bit more detail. Uh, one of the attachments on November 24th, last Wednesday, uh, the mayor and council sent a letter to our district attorney, Becton, uh, asking that uh, maximum prosecution be pursued with respect to those that have been arrested and any future arrests that be made. I do want to acknowledge uh, District Attorney Becton made a, a strong statement in terms of a media release that day as well, and also in coordination with other Bay Area district attorneys that they intend to pursue maximum charges uh, for those that have been arrested and, uh, and pursue that. So I do want to acknowledge and, and thank her for that. Additionally, there are letters to our State Assembly members, Rebecca bauer Cahan. Uh, Assemblymember Tim Grayson and State Senator Steve Glazier, and effectively the request that is proposed from your council is that they review the legislation that is in place, or put differently, the laws that are in place relative to these types of events to look to see if new laws are needed to help prevent these or modifications to tighten up some loopholes that may be in place that uh, allow these to happen more than anybody would like. That is uh, essentially what the requests are. And there we, we are entering the second year of a legislative session that will begin in January. And if your council is interested, we could have further discussion about formally requesting what specifically we might want to see made in terms of those changes. And then the other letter for your council's consideration is a letter to Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, Governor Newsom has made statements to the effect that the California Highway Patrol will be more available than they have in the past to help uh, deter these types of incidences and possibly help to respond, and also to make funding available in the upcoming budget year to help fund local cities and counties and other jurisdictions to prepare and respond and prevent these types of activities. And effectively, the letter is intended to help ensure that the, the governor uh, sees that this happens, that the CHP is available and this funding is made available. And I believe our request would be to simplify the funding process, not have to go through an elongated grant and an application process, but rather that there be uh, direct allocations that are made to assist in these types of matters. And that is all I have to share at this moment, but I'm available to answer any questions. All right. Do we have any questions regarding the letters, any suggested edits or changes? Councilmember Silva, everybody's looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. So I'm looking at the letters to the legislators, and I'm certain that the same types of comments to the governor will be helpful. Um, I'm anticipating a conversation of this ilk at 
the League of California Cities as well because um, for years, we'll just say four or five years, we've been focused on trying to, at the, at the state level among cities, to try to reduce the, loop, we'll call them loopholes, but basically when you change the law and you make petty crimes or you make certain crimes petty, but when 80 people show up to commit the same petty theft, that's a felony. That is just egregious abuse of what is essentially designed for the one individual um, not to be you know, hung by his thumbs for stealing a loaf of bread. This is different. Is that the loophole we're talking about, and should we be more specific in these letters as to what the law needs to really say to deter organized petty theft? Sorry, it took me a while to roll up to my basic question, and I would be delighted to have the DA even help weigh in here because um, the DA's office certainly understands what the law is as well. But Yeah, I, I believe your points are, are, are very spot on. I, these letters were written to be slightly more general in nature as this is intended to be the beginning of the conversation. And a, a considerable more research will need to be done. Obviously, this meeting was convened within 10 days of the event occurring. And we would want more time to specifically research what the ask may be and clearly have additional meetings, certainly with our state legislators, and would obviously welcome a meeting with the governor to discuss this more thoroughly as well if that were feasible. But I, I would recommend at this point keeping these a little more general in nature to begin the conversation and then have subsequent more detailed requests and, and formal requests of what we would make of our legislators. I can see that point, but I can also see that for four or five years that we've been trying to say that there are loopholes in um, the propositions and the early release programs that have, in some ways, were basically dictated to us by the federal courts and the federal Department of Justice because of overcrowding in the prison system. All that aside, I've never heard a real strategy put forward as to what we're really trying to deter most significantly. And, and we now have this and we're experiencing it. And if this is what we, what is the biggest issue we are facing, then perhaps we need to be, have in our mind what we're going to ask as opposed to let's start a conversation which usually takes four to five years if we're not careful. Council member, <laughs> ask Council you. member next to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I agree with you, and I almost was led down the path where I almost was saying, yes, we need to include that. At further thought, I honestly think that we don't yet know how this whole system works and how they organize and, and, and what, you know, what's the difference between a fad where all of a sudden everybody thinks every bad person or person with bad intentions um, thinks it's a great thing to join the fad and, and, and it's gonna be a rush and then it'll lose interest as, as individual um, law enforcement people figure out how to stop it and know about it's coming um, versus really, really making a change in the law. I, you know, we've, we, at the League of Cities, we've already talked about whether we wanna make um, recommend that uh, the social media be responsible when they're part of a um, conspiracy like this. I mean, it, I'm not sure we yet know what the specific questions are. And if we get too granular here, then we can't, then they'll stop listening to us and think we've done our best, best effort first. Just a quick way yeah. in. Councilmember Darling. You know, I think what Captain Brown said is what I would like to see focused on, which is prevention. And you prevent by creating consequences, which can deter future efforts. You, did, you get to prevention by better detection, better technology, um, just focusing our, we want to prevent this by creating appropriate consequences and, um, you know, so I think circulate or putting, I can't edit the letter on the fly, but focusing on prevention is what we want to do and all the different tools to get there. Consequences, detection, um, hardening on in our retail environment. And I guess I would say, we're having a conversation about questions. Are you okay with that? That's, that's fine. This, uh, <laughs> I'd rather have a summary and discussion at this point for this particular item. 
I think closing loopholes is vague and will be interpreted at the state legislative level because of the way it's been positioned over the last four to five years that it's about redefining misdemeanors and felonies and moving the needle at the description of the crime level or the definition of the crime as opposed to trying to deter and prevent organized retail theft. And, you know, I think we might need to be a little more focused in the letter. Yeah. Not on what the necessary solution is, but they were going to interpret this a different way, I believe, in Sacramento than what we're really trying to say to them, which I think you said it more clearly than I did, Council Member Charlie. Well, I, I also think that we not only need to ensure that we're covering everything here, but making a statement that, as we've just heard about, Walnut Creek's responsible for the immediate deterrence and what we can do as a city. But this is a collaborative effort. We're going to be talking more about this with all parts of the criminal justice system, between the, the sheriff's office, the DA's office, and ultimately the laws that are out there so that we can ensure that the law coverage can work within the entire criminal justice system and they have the teeth within the law. So I, want to, I, I do want to make sure that, that we're general to a point, but if there's some tightening up that you see a specific line that could be uh, that could be added. I mean, we don't have to send this out this afternoon. We can work on this, and then it can be sent out in the next day or two. And I think in that discussion of prevention and getting to consequences, that brings into play the issues that Council Member Silva mentioned about the changes due to initiatives, the changes due to the court orders on our jails, um, and all that is part of the same thing, but focusing it on prevention. So uh, let me ask Dan or the city attorney on this. Uh, it, it sounds like we're going to be accepting of this as, as we get to the vote part later in, uh, in general on this, but how would we handle this for some any kind of edits? Yeah, I think it's as you noted. If there's some direction from council, you can give us direction uh, with some language to consider, and we can revise that, work with you, Mayor, and get those signed and out you know, possibly tomorrow or certainly this week sometime based upon the direction from council here this evening to incorporate the sentiment that was expressed here. I'd also I'll note, I, if you're interested, uh, mayor and council, we do have our district attorney here. I believe a representative of the sheriff's department is on Zoom as well if you yeah. wanted to hear from them before finalizing any direction on this matter. Terrific. All right, thank you. And then afterwards, we would discuss the third item. Right. Okay. So let me ask, I believe that we do have a representative from the Sheriff's Department on Zoom, Steve Simpkins, and uh, I'm going to ask the city clerk to bring in Mr. Simpkins, and we'll start this by, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask if there's a statement that you would like to make up at the top of the Sheriff's role in, in this from the time that the suspects were handed over to the Sheriff's Department and what happened at that point, because I think we may have some questions for you as well in, uh, in what's happened since the November 20th theft. So, and I see you on. Welcome. Good, good morning, Mayor. I, uh, I apologize, but when in the process between uh, being promoted to a panelist, uh, your comments went offline, so I, I, I didn't uh, hear what the question was. Sure. My apologies. <laughs> no problem. I'll repeat my, I'll, I'll repeat it. No problem. Uh, so I'd like to ask if you have a statement first to be able to make this, uh, maybe update uh, everyone on what happened from the time that the suspects were handed over to the Sheriff's Department, uh, how that, how that process worked, and uh, because we've heard that two were released last week and then one was uh, was, was brought back in, and then now that one is out on bail. So we just would like to hear a little bit about what the sheriff's role in all of that is, and then we may have some questions for you as well. Sure. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you to you and the city manager and the chief and the council for uh, giving us an opportunity uh, and letting me speak and uh, representing Sheriff Livingston. So uh, upon arrest, uh, all, all three people were booked into jail, and uh, – as a reminder, and as your city manager kind of set the stage, everyone has their own role in the criminal justice system. And as far as running the jail is concerned, we abide by what court orders and the current laws are and uh, what the judge's uh, direction is. So 
Uh, when anyone is booked into our facility on what's called an on-view charge, which is what would have occurred during this incident, uh, there's a certain amount of time in which the police department needs to prepare their case, bring it to the district attorney where charges are filed. During that time period, uh, we have a requirement that the sheriff's office must be notified whether or not charges will be filed. And so charges were filed on all three people in this case. However, uh, as we've stated, due to a computer input error, we did not catch that charges had been filed on one of the suspects. And regrettably, that person was released. Uh, they are now back in custody. And you know, we recognize that that caused a distraction for this important situation in your community. However, they're back in custody. Uh, whether or not someone stays in custody is a decision that is made by the courts. And the reason why the other person is out of custody is because they posted bail. So, you know, again, in any arrest situation, uh, bail is, is, is an entitlement unless bail has been taken away. Uh, that person did post a bail bond, and that's the reason why they are released and continue to be. If we receive orders from the court that says that that bail has been revoked or changed, then that person will be in custody. And then same goes for the people who are in custody now. Uh, they will stay in custody until we are told not to let, not to have them in custody. So I, ho I hope that was clear enough. I'm trying to give a kind of a general explanation there as to uh, what our role is as the detention facility. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let me quickly ask, and I'll turn it over to counsel for questions as well. Could you elaborate on computer input error? What does that mean? Well, it's human error, Mayor, and that's, uh, you know, this is a, a regrettable mistake on our end. Uh, everyone that was supposed to do their job did their job. You know, the, the case was brought in uh, by your police department. Charges were filed by the DA's office, and due to an input error in a computer here on by a human, uh, it was not caught that the charges were filed. So unfortunately, the person was due for release based on the way the penal code is read. There's a certain amount of time that, uh, that charges need to be filed within. And if it appears on our end that charges were not filed, then we don't have a legal requirement to keep the person. So okay. Thank it's you a that. human, it's unfortunately, it's a human error. Bottom line. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Councilmember Darling. Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Um, just a couple quick questions. We heard from our um, officers here that it does take three to four hours to book somebody at the jail. Is that just a function of the way the jail works or is it a function of staffing and workload? And thank you, Councilmember. I appreciate the opportunity to address that question because uh, there's a, there's a couple of factors that I'd like to share with everybody. And you know, of of course, as your uh, as your chief mentioned, that uh, you know, COVID's been an issue for all of us. And you know, among the other responsibilities we have here at our detention facilities, we also have a responsibility to very strictly follow COVID protocols. And certainly, uh, all those COVID protocols have to be uh, followed, and they have slowed down the booking process. Uh, that is that is a fact. Uh, however, uh, the three hour time frame would probably be more accurate as far as door to door as far in, in instead of actual time at our back door. Uh, and I try not to use slang there, but our you know when when we our prisoners are dropped off, arrestees are dropped off, they come into our back door and we start that processing time. I would say that uh, even with the uh, COVID protocols in place, Best case scenario, we are, you know, we're looking at in the more like the hour to hour and a half range to follow those. Uh, but however, as Captain Brown mentioned, you know, there there is the functionality of timing. Uh, if, you know, if Walnut Creek Police Department shows up right behind, uh, you know, a van full from another agency anywhere else in the county, it's the dead Murphy's Law has struck. Yeah. Okay. And then I was hearing through the news reports that one of the suspects arrested here would have would not have been released if their parole officer had filed something and that's the limit of what i understand but that's what the news was reporting Do you, what can you add there 
Right. And I, I saw the same news report. Uh, however, we don't uh, oversee parole or probation, so I don't have any specific input that I could offer on that. And that was input probably going into the court side of the system, not into your side of the system. Parole and probation have their own methodology of entering uh, holds or, or warrants or uh, orders to detain. And it's just, it's not something we oversee. It certainly would be something that we would check prior to release, but it's not a function that we oversee. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Haskew. Could you explain um, the bail process? Because it seems like the person was only in, in your custody for a certain amount of time and then immediately out on the streets. Um, how does bail happen? Yes, ma'am. So uh, the bail schedule is something that is set by the presiding judge and the judges in our county. And uh, a bail is set for specific offenses. And uh, what we do is we follow very strictly the bail schedule. So you know, if a crime, if the bail is $10,000, then we follow what is written on the bail schedule by our, our court. And so uh, in this case, if the person's bail is $140,000, then they are allowed to post that bail. And that can be done within several hours. It can happen in an expeditious process. It's, uh, you know, again, as you're as your city manager open with there, we all have our own roles in the justice system and bail is certainly part of it. And people are allowed to have bail and our bail schedule is set by the courts. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Silva. <clears throat> Thank you for your um, information. And it's really interesting to hear about how the processing works at the county detention facilities. So if I'm an officer and I'm delivering a detainee for um, processing into the detention facility. I arrive, let's say in Martinez, because that would obviously be the closest to us, I believe. Am I able to just drop the individual off and say, hey, call me when the time comes, or do I have to stay with the detainee through that whole process, I the officer? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I understand your question. Uh, no, we, we couldn't do something like that. So, you know, we have, uh, uh, in essence, when a police department arrests someone, uh, they are uh, they own uh, that situation until we are able to uh, medically screen uh, and make sure that the person is suitable for booking. And so, uh, you know, we, we have several steps. Uh, COVID, of, of course, throwing uh, one of the wrench into the system to to delay things. We have, you know, to have a safe quarantine because you know again it's an important responsibility for the sheriff's office to to minimize and keep COVID out of these detention facilities as best as possible. Uh, but also, you know, we have we have to screen for contraband. Uh, we have a, uh, a scanner machine that you know each person coming into the facility, much much like going through the airport, is is scanned to make sure that no contraband is coming in. Uh, there's a fingerprinting process, uh, a mental health clearing to make make sure uh, that there's no, you know, suicidal ideations or risk. Uh, that, you know, a variety of those processes have to occur, uh, and it's important, you know, for, um, you know, if for example, if there is a significant medical issue that uh, we would not want to receive that person into the jail, they would need to be taken to the hospital, and that screening process needs to take place prior to us formally accepting custody of the arrestee. So the long and the short of it is, until you accept the detainee, the local police department who has made the arrest and delivered them to the detention facility is responsible and must stay on site. Yes, ma'am, that is spot on correct. Thank you. One quick question. Councilmember Darling. Hypothetically, if somebody showed up with 80 suspects at a time, what would that take? Well, uh, we certainly wouldn't be able to do that in three hours. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, we, we have uh, a significant amount of resources available and uh, we, you know, we're, we are here to help and we would work our way through that problem as best as possible. Uh, you know, I, I think when you, when you hear from your chief talking about bringing in extra resources, we have the same resources available. Uh, we would we would bring in extra staffing, open extra booking stations, and we would work our way through that. Um, you know, the other uh, I you know would have to 
asked too that it would be pretty difficult to uh, transport all of those people from Walnut Creek. So I'm sure we would get involved into that process as well because we have uh, buses that are set up to transport to courts and whatnot. And and again, it's uh, you know it's 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 important to recognize here that we're you know the sheriff's office, Sheriff Livingston, we're here to uh, you know provide these important resources to the Walnut Creek community and to the entire county. Uh, and, and if I can take just a moment, you know, one of the things that that was mentioned is that uh, the sheriff's office is going to be helping out with some extra staffing in the downtown area, and you know that's a personal commitment from Sheriff Livingston that. Uh, you know, significant staffing increase for the holidays is, is there to help keep Walnut Creek residents and all of our county residents safe. It's, it's our number one priority. Thank you. All right, thank you for the questions to date. I have, uh, I'd like to dive in a little bit more regarding the convicted felon who was in possession of a gun. And assuming that when she was booked that the deputies uh, were able to find out in fairly short order that this was a convicted felon in possession of a weapon, uh, how would the parole office know this, that she had been arrested? I just want to understand more clearly the granularity of what led to her actually still being on the streets when this appears to be the most serious of the crimes of the people that we were able to apprehend. Well, sir, I don't disagree with you, but uh, again, our role in the criminal justice system is to receive those charges and to book the people in. However, the charging component and the decision to file charges on that rests with the district attorney's office. And so a, you know, a question as to why particular charges were filed in the case would have to be directed to the district attorney's office. And how much do you communicate with the district attorney's office? The, your office, well, not you personally. <laughs> we Thank you. Uh, we, we all communicate on a regular basis. Uh, you know, they there's functions in, in every police and sheriff's agency where uh, our, our staff work together on a regular basis. Thank you very much. Do we have any further questions? Um, uh, Deputy Sheriff, do I have that uh, title right? Uh, uh, it's, it's Assistant Sheriff. Assistant Sheriff, appreciate uh, you being on and answering these questions. Thank you very much. There may be some other topics that come up that you'll probably want to pay attention to and, and listen, but I really appreciate you making yourself available for this. Thank you. No problem. Uh, and so now I would like to ask if District Attorney Becton would uh, be so kind as to come up and maybe provide a little bit of clarity of then what happens. So we're, we're, we're moving along the process here, and now everything is in the DA's office. And so how does this work once the booking is made and now the paperwork lands on the computer of the DA's office and, uh, and we'll go from there. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and for the mayors and uh, council members and, and appreciate the uh, job that has been done by the city manager to set the stage about our uh, various roles. So first, um, I would like to start out just with a clear statement from the district attorney's office that the brazen acts of organized retail theft that we have recently seen are not going to be tolerated in Contra Costa County. These recent acts of retail thefts, of robberies and of burglary, um, we don't intend to allow to be set as a new normal for us. Anyone who is caught engaging in such conduct will face swift prosecution to the full extent of the law. I first want to share with you some of the strategies that we are employing during this unprecedented season of organized criminal activity. First, we have formed an alliance. Uh, you heard earlier that there are a number of counties across Northern California who have suffered from similar acts, uh, brazen acts of criminal activity. So I have formed an alliance with six, six district attorneys from San Joaquin, Alameda, San Francisco, Marin, San Mateo, and Santa Clara counties, along with law enforcement and state agencies. We have come together to combat the retail theft rings that are operating what we believe to be across jurisdictional boundaries, and to jointly announce that the premeditated retail thefts in multiple cities across Northern California will not be tolerated by our offices. While police work to strengthen investigations and collaborations across jurisdictional boundaries, 
prosecutor offices are also similarly working to ensure accountability through information sharing. The alliance across counties is strategic because all too often organized retail thieves steal from different and nearby counties. The alliance that I have formed along with other prosecutors, with other district attorney offices allows us to share information through data collection, crime analysis, and pooled investigative resources to successfully prosecute those who are involved in organized crime. We are also organizing and convening as you speak an alliance with mayors and police chiefs from Walnut Creek, Concord, Pleasant Hill, and Clayton. We will meet uh, as soon as possible in the next few days to develop strategies and pull together resources to combat this retail theft uh, that is operating across our boundaries. We have also met with the State Attorney General's Office to discuss ways to combat organized retail theft and to develop solutions that might be driving this crime. <clears throat> As you've also uh, heard, Governor Newsom has ordered the CHTP to provide additional armed protection at major shopping malls across the state as retail robbers have become more frequent and brazen. This strategy includes a presence near the freeways, which is also useful for those jurisdictions that have the freeway cameras and the license plate readers. Also, um, we have in Contra Costa County the Safe Streets Task Force, which um, uh, allows us to um, work strategically with all of law enforcement agencies in our county. Um, as far as the recent prosecutions um, related to the recent activity, arrests have been made, as you've discussed and the Contra Costa County's District Attorney's Office is committed to continuing to work with our law enforcement partners and our retail community to hold those accountable involved in retail thefts. We are committed to stopping those who participate in organized retail theft, which has, of course, adverse effects on our entire community. Specifically related to the thefts at Nordstrom Walnut Creek on November 20th, 2021, when approximately 90 individuals stormed in Nordstrom department store simultaneously using separate entrances. Three individuals, as you've, as you've heard, were apprehended. They were arrested by the Walnut Creek Police Department, and those individuals have been charged with various felony charges involving conspiracy, burglary, robbery, and organized retail theft. Two individuals, as, you've, as you have heard, are in custody. They have bail set at $160,000 for one and at $140,000 for the other. The individual that was um, mis um, released um, and is now back in custody, my office was in court yesterday to appear at the court hearing to let the court know about the error and also to request that bail be set in accordance with the schedule. The court agreed and remanded that person into custody yesterday. The remaining individual had bail set at $190,000 and that bail was posted and released um, and that person was released prior to the court hearing, which took place yesterday. Um, we also just is uh, a related, um, May, may not be a related case, but we had an additional case. An individual was charged with retail theft and carjacking yesterday, stemming from the November 24th incident that began at the Ace Hardware store in Blackhawk and culminated in an arrest in San Ramon. So that is the update that I have for you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Appreciate that, District Attorney Becton. Um, We'll start with Councilmember Darling on questions. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for coming down today. I appreciate the chance to ask some questions. Um, so it sounds like given the regional nature, and this is us continuing to pull apart the criminal justice system so we can all understand it, Walnut Creek PD has the primary role investigating what happened at Nordstrom. Is the district attorney's office doing additional investigation using your resources into the more regional yep. owner of the crime? So as you've heard, initially we do rely on, we've had a great working relationship with the Walnut Creek Police Department to bring those cases uh, when arrests have been made into our office and we have filed the charges. 
We also have a law enforcement arm. It's uh, small, but sometimes there is additional uh, investigation that needs to be done on the case. And of course, we work with our agency and also with our own investigative uh, team to conduct additional uh, investigation. Okay. And then as far as the decision on what charges to bring, I saw that the San Francisco District Attorney brought in uh, federal charges on some of the suspects that had been appropriate or had been arrested relative to the Louis Vuitton um, robbery. Yeah. I, I didn't hear about federal charges. I, I, I just saw it in the newspaper. And I was just wondering, is there a federal criminal statute that would apply in a situation like that? We, like we can certainly work with our federal law enforcement uh, partners. We are fortunate here in Contra Costa County that we do have the FBI Safe Streets Task Force that we work with as well. And so as we begin to gain more information and more data about these cases, um, we can also work with the FBI and our federal partners to see if there are crimes that should be charged at that level as well. Okay, and you know, we're looking at this as prevention from something happening in the future. Sorry, I should get closer to my microphone. I hate the masks. Um, but prevention and make, ensuring that there's consequences is a part of that in my mind. Um, how do you, how would you tackle something like this where you obviously only get a small percentage of the people involved? Um, would you use a strategy to um, seek higher consequences on that smaller percentage to deter other folks from? Well, we have to analyze each case and the evidence that comes in with each case. And in this case, um, I brought with me the specific complaints just in case you wanted to know what charges were filed in these particular cases. They are all felony charges. They all carry serious uh, consequences for the behavior that happened here. And um, hopefully um, this will be a deterrent going forward to others who might commit these brazen acts in our county or in other counties that surround us. And is there an opportunity to um, seek more information from the suspects who are in custody about, I mean, I, I doubt if these are the, the lynch, I doubt if these are the linchpins of the whole effort. Um, whose job is it to question them and see if you could get them to, uh, well, I mean, I know how yeah. it happens in the TV shows, but I don't know Absolutely. how it happens in real life. <laughs> well, it's an interesting question because obviously once people are in custody, they are entitled, they have certain rights, right? They are entitled to have a lawyer and they're entitled not to make any statements whatsoever. So whether or not we actually gain statements from those individuals, I think some have already made uh, statements to law enforcement as part of the initial arrest, but that is uh, certainly something that we can uh, look into. In addition to that, as we continue to work with our law enforcement partners, there are many other resources that we can bring to bear. There can be search warrants that might be issued. Sometimes we can get information and data from their social media pages and from their phones, et cetera. So there are all kinds of tactics that we have available to us as we continue the investigations. All right, thank you. All right, Councilmember Haskew. Yeah, um, how, do, how does all of this, and I pro, I'm, I'm hoping you're the person that can answer it, <laughs> how does all of this fall together because we had somebody who broke probation and probably could have just gone straight to jail because of that. Correct me if that assumption is wrong. Um, but who is responsible for working with the probation department and making sure that people who are still under um, legal control, um, they, they have responsibilities, they, they get their, their desserts faster? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, ask either um, Chief Fox uh, to also help uh, with the answer because typically when the cases come into our office, we rely on our law enforcement partners to let us know that whether a person is on parole. You're mentioning prob probation, but in this instance, it would have been parole. Uh, our deputy who was in court yesterday uh, did make a plea to the judge to let the judge know that we were hoping uh, and waiting uh, for a parole hold to be filed on the individual. Um, the judge indicated that there was nothing yet in our system and therefore um, we would have to wait until that parole hold is in place before the judge will take action on that individual. So in the meantime, um, they are um, 
uh, as we've indicated, they had a $190,000 bail, and that person is currently out of custody. They did appear in court yesterday. So, Councilmember Haskew, typically when we make an arrest, we run the person out for wants and warrants. And if they are on parole, we would usually get a hit. And at that point, we would call the parole office and request something known as a parole hold. Uh, we're still looking into this, but in this particular case, I don't believe we got a hit from parole, but uh, we are following up to find out uh, what happened there. Thank you. Councilmember Silva. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here this morning. Um, I know you visited with us about three weeks ago, and it seems um, an unfortunate opportunity that you're back again with some of the things we were chatting about just generically sure. um, three weeks ago. So we are preparing to send letters to the state legislators as well as to the governor. And the letter says, and there's a phrase in it, work with us to close the loopholes in legislation. I need to know what those loopholes are. So let me ask a little more specifically. So we have three people that we arrested that were booked on November 20th for the crimes of stealing, of retail theft in the Nordstrom. If they had, would there be a difference if they'd been arrested for just doing that on their own? Same car, same, same people. Would there have been, is the charge the same if they'd done it alone as if they've done it in, in mass at the same time that okay. other 77 or, nine, or 87 other people were doing the same? It, it depends because one of the charges, and um, let me just mention what that particular charge is. One of the charges in this case is an allegation that the individuals committed a felony violation of Penal Code Section 490.4, .4, which is a code section that specifically addresses organized retail theft. And so in that instance, it is two or more people operating together. And so even with two or three people, a person, you know, or a group, uh, a smaller group, it doesn't have to be 90 people who are operating together. It could be a smaller number of individuals, and they still could be uh, charged with organized retail theft. And as what a is the consequence if you are found guilty of violating penal code, whatever those numbers were, sure. well, or organized could, theft? It could, it could carry a prison sentence. It's a felony. Uh, so is that what makes it a felony as opposed to just grabbing some Louis Vuitton bags? Yeah. What? The, the distinction is generally related as well to the amount of the theft. And so if the theft is over $950, which I don't think in this instance we will have any difficulty uh, proving, we've heard already that this organized group stole over $87,000 okay. worth of merchandise. And so as long as we can prove that the individuals had more than uh, $950 worth of merchandise, uh, but we also have allegations that in addition that, uh, to the organized retail theft, we have conspiracy charges, we have a number, burglary, robbery, we have a number of charges here that overlap in some ways, but they can also stand away alone in other ways. So is the trigger point, I'm sorry, is the trigger point the amount, of the dollar valuation, because this That's has been the debate at correct. the state level, correct. is the dollar valuation, or is the trigger point that multiple people are involved because you could have 80 people steal $500 worth of goods each in gift cards and be in and out in 45 seconds. There are more than one trigger point, as I mentioned. First, we have the conspiracy, right? So this is not dealing with the dollar amount at all. When you have 80 people who come together, the allegation is that they came together and conspired. That in and of itself is a felony. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with the dollar amount. We also have uh, uh, allegations of a uh, robbery. And, and so they're all things that can be charged without even considering the dollar amount. The specific one that I was mentioning to you, though, the organized retail theft, is two or more people coming together. And so if two or more people come together regardless of the, of the amount, to commit the organized retail theft, then we can also make the case that the dollar amount can be aggravated in that situation, right? So in your discussions with A.G. Bonta, 
any indicators from his office as to what loophole, what we could do at the state level legislatively to shore this up and create consequences that would deter people from getting, getting in a parade and coming and doing this. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know exactly what loopholes the council had in mind. I mean, that it's, it's not my, my letter or my words. Um, I certainly think that with the tools that we have on our books right now, the tools for conspiracy, the tools for robbery, for burglary, for organized theft, we have a lot of tools at our discretion that are all felony charges that carry serious consequences. Um, and so I, I don't know what loopholes you all had in mind. If you had something in spe specific that you're thinking about, I can certainly try to address those speci specificities. Okay. And let me just come back to one. Let me just, just want, circle around one other, okay. and then it's still it, in the it's, same it's genre. That question. Okay. So what you're saying to me is that it's not the valuation, but it's the organized conspiratorial elements that make this a felony and make it serious. And does does you do you have to be the leader of the pack, or you, can you just be a participant to be accused of being in organized retail theft and conspiracy? There's nothing in the statute that talks about a person being the leader. It is two or more people coming together to commit certain types of crime. Okay, thank you. So, so on, on that point, and I, I think I know the answer, but I'm just gonna make sure I know the answer. So if somebody is involved in this crime and there's an organized theft that occurs, somebody could steal a toothbrush and still be charged with a felony if that toothbrush is worth a dollar because they're organized. If, if, if we have the, enough information to prove that the people came together in an organized way to commit this crime. Now, naturally, um, there, th there is a part of the statute that talks about a dollar amount. And so generally, when we're talking about an organized retail theft, we're not talking about crimes that occur that are less than $950. We're talking about crimes that occur where there are massive amounts of goods that are taken. That, that's typically what we're talking about when we talk about organized retail theft. Most people are not organizing to go into the store to steal $100. The people that are organizing are organizing to go in. They're stealing high-end goods that have a high dollar value. And that's where the statute is most appropriate. I'm thinking more of the person where you've got, let's, as an example, an organized theft of with 20, 30 people, one person happens to steal something that is worth far less. They're still but aggregated they're group, together. Right, they're organized. And so if one person stole $1,000 and one person stole $500, but you're charging them as having been yep. organized in this retail theft, then it means that they could all be charged with that felony. That's the answer I was looking for. And uh, what about the driver of a car that may just be sitting in the car is the, uh, that's still part of the organized ring? They're Correct. still brought yeah. into that, is right? That's, that's the allegation that we have here. Okay, great, thank you. I apologize for stepping in here. If you have more questions, please no, go that, ahead. I knew we were probably circling the same, so thank you. Okay, I, I do have a few questions, and again, thank you okay. for your patience with us. Um, I, I want to ask, uh, and, I, and you answered this up front regarding that particular penal code, but uh, do props, propositions 40, 47 and 57 play into this at all when it comes to charging people? When it comes not to organized this, retail not theft? Not in this case at all, because okay. we, we know that Prop 47, which was a response to the overcrowding, right, and it did change the dollar amount uh, of uh, when a case could be charged as a felony um, to say that it had to be $950 or more. But in this case, this is not it's not even part of our discussion because we have $87,000 worth of goods that were taken. So, Great. Um, would you uh, uh, allow me the pleasure, because I, I don't understand this either, and I'm sure most people that are watching this may not understand all the specifics. What's the difference between looting, robbery, burglary, and theft? And I'm sure there's some overlap in here. Sure. Well, so especially when it comes to commercial burglary and robbery. Sure, the primary, I wanna just focus on the looting. I think that's really where the, the crux of the, the, the question uh, lies. And the looting statutes were developed uh, uh, close in time 
to the Rodney King uh, uh, riots that took place. And the statutes typically talk about there being some type of a natural disaster that occurs and then having people commit certain types of crimes while they are taking advantage of the um, natural disaster or the state of emergency that exists. And so it gives us an opportunity when those circumstances exist to charge uh, the looting as well as the burglary or the, the um, robbery case and um, face higher consequences there as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to ask a little bit of uh, more detail about the collaboration and working between the Sheriff's Department and the DA, especially when it comes to um, the prisoners that uh, that were, or the I should say the suspects that were apprehended that became prisoners. Uh, so we heard from the Sheriff's Department that they hadn't received information uh, from one of the suspects about parole and therefore they they didn't have the charges to keep them on how uh, and they said they didn't hear from the DA's office how should that have gone I, I'm, what I want to understand I, here is I don't think they didn't they didn't say they didn't hear from the DA's office because what he indicated was that the DA's office did what the DA's office was supposed to do which is to file the charges and implement and put it into the system there was a glitch on their end where they did not uh, understand that the charges had been filed on one individual. Okay. The charges right. were there, though. The charges were there. All right. Yes. And uh, you mentioned about the collaboration with other DA offices. That's terrific to hear because, as we know, that people that might be involved in, uh, in a crime like this don't care about county lines. So in the one instance, we heard a report that one of the uh, suspects had also committed a crime in Alameda County, yes. and now there's two of them, and is that information shared back and forth? Absolutely. And In fact, just yesterday I received a report from um, the Chief of Investigations for the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office that he was in contact already with law enforcement in Alameda County to make sure that we are sharing that information across jurisdictional lines. Okay, that's great to hear. Uh, we also heard that the DA's office wasn't aware that a couple of the uh, a couple of the suspects had been released prior to the arraignment. Uh, so that that's a concern. That is the sheriff's. Are you not hearing from the sheriff's department when people are released? Is that does that normally happen? No, no. I mean, people go. Lots of people go into custody every single day. Um, we uh, typically, I, I my office personally doesn't uh, receive the list, but. It is possible, I know the Sheriff's Department generates uh, a list of people who are in custody. So we, we typically use it when we're working in partnership with the DA's office, um, I'm sorry, with the Sheriff's Department and the courts and probation when we are looking at how to reduce the population, particularly due to COVID. That's when we will often collaborate and share those lists. Okay, all right, so uh, again, that, that's terrific to hear that kind of communication going. We need that, of course. I think we all need that. Everybody in the region is looking at this. And so the communication from the DA's office to the sheriff's office, ensuring that, that, when, uh, that they need to know when a parole violation has occurred, that, that handshake is occurring, it sounds like. It, the, in, the, in, in most instances, and I think as you heard uh, Chief indicate, um, when the law enforcement agency makes an arrest, they are going to check the system for wants and warrants as well. And so that communication can take place between all of our offices. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the DA? I appreciate you coming again. Uh, and uh, I, uh, if other questions come up, we'll let you know as well in the office. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Appreciate Thank that. You. And I think uh, it's been a couple of hours. Why don't we take a break for, let's say, five minutes, and uh, then we'll hit the, uh, at that point, we'll have the third portion of what we're going to be reviewing. Did we? Did we we didn't, we didn't finish um, staff advice about, because oh. there seems to be a controversy about what we think should be in the letter. So we have to come to a conclusion about Sure, why don't we, that. is everybody okay for a break until then? Wasn't sure how urgent this. Uh, you need to take a break. You need to take a break. <laughs> Let's come back to that in five minutes. Okay. Thanks.
have a sentence for him. Yep. Okay, and we're back. Uh, we left this at the point where we were going to be wrapping up the, uh, the part about the letter and any either suggestions, comments uh, regarding that specific portion of this discussion. And so let me first, um, let if me anybody. Just offer one thing up, if I could, Mayor. So yeah. certainly we would welcome uh, any direct general comments and feedback about the letter, but we should hold off on finalizing any final direction on this letter until after public comment when you Correct. take final actions on this whole agenda item. Great. All right. So if uh, let me start with Council Member Silva, who brought up the point in the first place, if you have any comments on that. I do, and I appreciate the letter. I think it's a good strategy to send letters to our legislators as well as to the governor. I actually think we might need to send a letter to the AG's office as well, um, and particularly because the AG is part of our neighboring communities. He is from Alameda, and so let's not leave that person out of the loop. Um, I think the sentence in the third paragraph needs to be clearer based on what we've talked about and what we're looking for, and I would change it vis-a-vis -vis the support of, we need the support of our state legislature, legislators to ensure that state law has clear substantive consequences that will deter organized retail theft. And I have it in writing. Can I? Yeah. Respond. Councilmember Haskew. Good job. You you listened and and you um, improved what you were looking for, and I think you got to. The it was a collaborative place. effort. All right. Uh, so we will discuss that once we come back and uh, further at the end of the meeting, following public comment, which brings us to the third portion of uh, our meeting today of the consideration item. Good morning uh, once again. So the third portion of this update is to discuss what is within your council's purview, and that is setting the budget for not only the city, but the police department and the allocations of, of resources. Uh, my office has had extensive discussions with the police department about what your council may be able to do in order to help prevent these types of situations and certainly to be able to respond more quickly. God forbid, should these types of situations ever occur again. I also want to point out that these recommendations were not made lightly, that we have endured considerable budget challenges as a result of COVID. You know, we, uh, we were forecasting and had to address budget gaps totaling $22 million since COVID has begun, uh, which was no easy task. We had to reduce our budget, uh, including the police department. And so, adding these types of this amount of money and these types of resources is not taken lightly the broader budget was taken into consideration and yet we're doing so because uh, we're recommending that this these are substantive actions your council can take to help address this type of situation that said uh, we are recommending the use of the federal stimulus funding to fund this. It is an absolute appropriate use. Public safety and general government services are allowable uses and uh, we think it's perfectly appropriate to do so. So I will uh, summarize briefly in the staff report as it is all written here. We are recommending the hiring of an additional beat effectively downtown that would be comprised of five officers, obviously our 24 seven operation. So those have to be, those five officers have to be spread out over that time. This would augment our existing beat and sector for the downtown area. We're recommending that these positions be authorized for roughly a year and a half through June of 2023. And at that time, we would revisit them as part of the annual budget process to determine both the necessity and the overall status of our city budget. Secondly, and this is the action would have the most immediate impact, is to increase our overtime in order to allow for two additional officers eight hours a day, three days a week in the prime time, uh, prime times of the week, basically Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, obviously I would defer to the chief to discuss how those officers would be deployed, but that is the most immediate uh, action that could be taken. Also you can see here additional funding for more security cameras, enhancing those that are already in place, not only uh, security cameras, but automated license plate readers and possibly greater integration with some of our traffic cameras that are used for 
other purposes other than law enforcement. And then lastly, which is the smallest of those noted, is related to a, a different type of drone that could be used that would require less resources to operate. Obviously, when we're dealing with this type of a situation, we want as many hands on deck and out in the field as possible. And if we can have one or two less folks operating a drone and instead be in the field and still have the benefit of that type of drone, drone video coverage, uh, that is what would be achieved with this recommendation. In total, we're looking at about uh, $2 million uh, that would be allocated of the four remaining. And to clarify, we have been allocated $8.3 million to, from the federal government, from the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, roughly $4 million has been used for uh, many other types of provisions of services that we provide, including expanded mental health support, additional training for law enforcement related to mental health services, library hours, um, uh, economic development, our rebound program, our restaurant grant program, so many other activities uh, have been funded through the Federal Stimulus Act funding that's provided here today. And uh, just to sum up the numbers, so with this, if your council were to authorize this recommendation, two million of the remaining four million would be utilized, which would leave two million dollars for additional consideration at a future date. And with that, uh, the chief and I are available to answer any questions. Thank you, Dan. All right, let's ask questions regarding this specific portion. Uh, Councilmember Darling, do you have any questions on this? Yes, thank you. Um, the first question is probably uh, Chief Knox's question. Um, the funding for the additional beat of officers is for a year and a half. Realistically, how long does it take to bring in a new officer? Well, that's a great question. It depends. Uh, there's a couple of different parts to that. The first part is actually recruiting and hiring, the hiring process uh, to include the background and medical screening can take anywhere from three to six months. Typically, we can get it done in about four months here. Mm -hmm. um, after that, it depends on the officer's level of experience. In the past, we have sent officers to a police academy, so that's another six months. If they're a lateral officer, an entry-level officer, or an officer who's um, just getting out of the academy, regardless, they still have to go through something known as a field training program, which is anywhere from 16 weeks up to six months. It just depends on the officer's experience level. So all told, you could be looking at any, anywhere from you know, seven or eight months up to 18 months for somebody who would have to, we'd, we'd hire, pay their way through the academy, they'd come out on field training, et cetera. So it, it would be a while, uh, but we are actively recruiting. Mm -hmm. uh, we're hoping that uh, if, if it's the council's will to adopt this resolution, that it would create some, some energy and some buzz in the region that Walnut Creek is uh, hiring a lot of officers and, and we're looking for new talent. Um, but we're you know constantly trying to streamline the hiring process, but to your point, it does take a lot of time. Okay, and then currently, how many officers do we have? We are currently authorized for 80 sworn officers. We have 75 filled right now, mm -hmm. but deployed is actually much, much less than that because we have some people out on long-term injury and disability. And so if we were going to hire, we have five slots we could hire on a, per, on a permanent basis, and this would give us an additional five slots to hire on a limited-term basis. Is that... Correct, and we would look at that, and correct me if I'm wrong, City Manager Buckshy, but we would look at it as an overhire situation. Yeah, so we could... Okay. Um, uh, Cindy, can I ask a quick yeah. question in the middle of that? So if, if we're af actively hiring, and I, I guess I'm just not getting my arms around this, if we're actively hiring now to fulfill the remaining five spots so that we're at fully staffed, if we authorize this to hire an additional five, uh, I, I don't understand because it's not like we're, tr we're turning down the five that we're trying to get to the point of being at 80 and fully staffed in the first place. So now we have an authorization for more officers, but we're still going through the same procedures to bring them on. Is that correct? That is correct. But where we're currently limited to only uh, four overhires, if we were to add additional five, then we could bring on more people at the same time and get them through the hiring process. Right. Thank you very much. For yeah, that. Let me just add to that briefly, if I could, Mayor. I mean, bottom line is there's always going to be some natural turnover, and we're always in a position of, of hiring. But if we have more officers on the books and we have the same percentage of vacancies, then we have more officers in the field. 
So I, I would kind of, let me try this and see if it makes sense. If you have a hard stop at 80, you can only fluctuate up to 80 and back down, depending on the officers. But if you can say, if you have authorization for 85 officers, you can target 85 and go above the 80 for a while and then, you know, just. Cor correct, and that would help us because w we try to plan for retirements, but sometimes you don't always. Uh, <laughs> they sneak up on you <laughs> yeah. sometimes. Um, you know, sometimes people see greener pastures, quite frankly, in other states, and we see, we see a lot of officers moving out of California to start a new life in other states for a variety of reasons, so it is tough to recruit right now. Um, but, you know, even though we try to anticipate when we might have vacancies, sometimes it's just not uh, predictable. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then on the additional security cameras, we talked about earlier about some of the cameras, and I think you were talking more of traffic cameras. Um, would these be, that were offline, um, would these be additional cameras that have license plate reader technology on them? That, that would be the goal. Uh, the, one of our intentions would be to possibly uh, bring a consultant on to look at our entire system as a whole and consider if some of the hardware needs to be upgraded so we could use some of that funding for that, but also to add some uh, key locations with ALPR technology um, to, to bolster our downtown security. And as part of that effort to look at the ALPR technology, could you also have a consultant look at the possibility of detecting absence of license plate? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Thank, that's my question. If I could add one thing, uh, Mayor and Council Member Darling, I just want to provide some perspective on traffic cameras and on our automated license plate readers, which are two different sets of technology. We have 49 traffic cameras in the city, and three were not functioning. So I want to maintain some perspective. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a relatively small number. That number varies a bit when we include our automated license plate readers, which some have been functioning, some have not. So the majority are working. This is really about how can we better integrate these systems, how can we add some, some key technology in some other areas where they currently do not exist? Great, thank you for that update. Uh, Council Member Haskell. Yeah, um, I'm gonna go back over a little history. Um, historically, we've had spells where downtown Walnut Creek has been a hotbed of attention because of um, late night activities, et cetera, and so forth. Um, I know this incident is a motivator, but we could probably, question mark, use another beat downtown just because it is where the most activity is? Yeah, we, we have a four sector or beat system, and we do have a sector that encompasses all of downtown, but it's a relatively large area. We use sectors in these beat boundaries for a couple of different reasons. One, to deploy resources, but also to collect uh, data. There's also smaller reporting districts within each of those beats. This particular downtown area is not staffed like the other sectors are because it lives within two other sectors. I know that's complicated. But uh, with additional bodies, we, be, we would be able to actually staff that as a specific beat. Um, not quite 24 seven, seven days a week, but close to it, we would focus on business hours where the downtown businesses are open, mainly during the day shift and the swing shift hours. Councilmember Silva. Thank you very much. Um, I understand that the hiring of five additional officers, whether you call them over hires or technically how it's structured from a um, legal perspective, is a process that can take a many, many, many numbers of months. So my real concern is not doing, I think we need to do that, but is also looking at what we can do to get boots on the ground in the near term, particularly during this holiday season, so that we can deter this and prevent it from happening. So that, in the terms of the increased overtime funding, that is one of the strategy, or the primary strategy that's being recommended here. But I'd like to go back and ask about our reserve officer program. <clears throat> According to Captain Brown, I remembered your title, um, we had one reserve officer on the, on the street on that Saturday night, yet my recollection is, Prior to COVID, our reserve officer program was was fairly robust. What is the status of the reserve officer program, and is that a strategy we can deploy in this um, instance as well? 
It, it certainly is. You know, the, the reserves, um, they provide a free service to the community, and they, there are a certain number of hours that they're required to fulfill to keep their certified status. Usually we let them pick and choose because these are all professionals with their own careers and obligations, and we can't mandate them to come in. So even though it's, uh, it's an available resource to us, I look at it as more of a luxury, um, and they've been able to uh, be very helpful uh, when it comes to downtown staffing during the weekends. Um, but they're, not, uh, they're limited on what they can do. Uh, many of them can't really work by themselves. They have to be in partners. So it's a limited resource. Um, during COVID, uh, we weren't having any volunteers work in the city for various, various safety reasons. When uh, the executive team uh, of the city uh, sort of bolstered our COVID uh, and vaccination policies uh, to kind of shore up some, some deficiencies we had and to create more safety, we started bringing volunteers back. And that's why you saw some reserves starting to come back. Um, of course, the vaccination thing is a whole different conversation, but our reserve officers are available to us, but again, we can't mandate them to come in. They usually um, work when it's convenient for them. So it's a tool in the toolbox, but you can't make any promises as to what the staffing levels would be through that. That's correct. <clears throat> okay, this is a wild idea, but I wrote it down earlier. Are we able to tap into our other agencies that surround us for overtime loaners like Pleasant Hill. Okay, can we can we buy overtime from Pleasant Hill and have them come work during critical hours for us? The law, the pension system, all those nuances allow for that. Right. Yeah, typically we would utilize, you know, our sister agencies during mutual aid or automatic aid situations. Um, I don't know of of departments actually doing that. One challenge with that is you're asking somebody specifically to come in and work in your jurisdiction where you have a different set of policies um, that might not be in alignment with their policies and training. So it's, um, it's kind of a convoluted situation. That's something that we could certainly look into though. Even if they were basically assigned to those other sectors for patrolling so that our neighborhoods were continued to be protected and we could deploy our um, own officers downtown. It's just a thought. Right. I, well, I don't say it out loud. It just sits on my piece of paper. Right. And the sheriff's department has offered to uh, provide uh, a sheriff's deputy to help us with the downtown area. The difference with the sheriff's department is they have jurisdiction in the entire county. My last question has to do with the tether drone. Is this something that you can deploy at Maine? and Mount Diablo every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night and just send it up and just have it sit there watching? Potentially, yes. The tether drone is an unmanned uh, aerial vehicle where our current drones that we have really require two people to operate them. You have the, the drone pilot and then you have a spotter or an observer. This particular drone, you only need one person. It deploys at the, the push of a button up to 150 feet in the air, so it really gives you a bird's eye view and it, can sit, it could stay in that position for 24 hours as it's on a tether and uh, receiving power uh, uh, directly and constantly. Uh, we could deploy that from a vehicle. That's typically how it's deployed, but uh, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be able to deploy it from a building if we needed to. We could use it for a variety of situations, but the drone technology has been proven to be very useful as technology develops even more. It can be integrated into other camera systems to detect real-time traffic patterns and to give our men and women on the street, boots on the ground, so to speak, uh, real-time information. So if something had been sitting above the Pottery Barn building from that garage on that Saturday night, that drone could potentially have seen what was about to happen 30, 30 seconds earlier than when, it, <laughs> when the horns started getting back. That's correct, or even detected it uh, even further out, depending on where, on where the drone is placed, if it does see a pack of vehicles running red lights and doing this follow the leader um, kind of method of or, or, or mode of uh, crime, if you will, then we could uh, leverage technology to get some sort of alert based on that. Okay, thank you.
Sure. Uh, just to follow up on that, does the drone have uh, the ability to record footage and that footage be kept for reviewing later? Yes, my understanding is you could both record it and live stream it. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, one more question on the officers. So I know that we've got officers that have been, that we've already agreed to on past city council meetings to be present during overtime duty that's voluntary, that's at Nordstrom and Apple, at least those that, and, and John Muir Hospital, but those are the two that I'm thinking of downtown. Is that correct? It's purely voluntary? Yes, and that's part of the contract with each of those organizations. Um, when they're not guaranteed to be filled, we do let the officers pick and choose what works best for them. Um, but uh, for this overtime, we would actually use that specific to downtown, and actually mandate those shifts to be filled, utilizing other units within the department if we needed to. Okay, it's, and so this voluntary overtime then that's at the stores, that then is is back in the queue. So the, the mandatory overtime hours are filled first, and then the stores would be after that. That's correct. Uh, the priority would be to staff all of downtown and not just focus on individual stores. So on the storefront then, is there a way to encourage officers to take additional overtime for the, for those voluntary overtime hours? Well, we, we do encourage that. And quite frankly, after the 20th, a lot of our men and women stepped up to the plate and they willingly signed up for those because they knew that there was a real need in the community. Um, it does help that it's uh, the holidays and officers might want a little extra Christmas money. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, the ultimate goal is to staff those positions, uh, but we need more people available to fill those overtime shifts. We do have four officers in training right now. A couple of them are very close to getting out uh, on their own, so that will be very helpful. And so I'm really hopeful that these overtime shifts with our contracts will go up. Thank you. That's re that's really helpful. Well, hey, one quick one more question. Okay. Yeah, one quick overtime question. Um, is there? I know as we make it mandatory, um, what's the stress level within the department? Um, is this going to make that worse Ooh. in any way? Right. No, that's a great question. That's something that we look at. Uh, we're also looking at a completely new deployment model that would bolster our staffing and the size of our shifts to help us absorb sick callers. So uh, even though you know we'd be asking for this allocation, we would be very mindful on when we implemented it and also very mindful of our uh, employee mental health to make sure that everybody was getting enough rest. Um, but something that we really haven't done yet is to tap into some of our other uh, units that are available to us that don't typically work overtime and patrol our investigations unit, our traffic unit. So we do have other resources. Thank you. Nope, no problem. Um, my last question is for uh, city manager. Is the request for funds that we're looking at here then being taken away from anything else that we may have been counting uh, or currently thinking about using it for? These funds have not been allocated to date, so it's not coming at the expense of anything in the near, ter near term. Obviously, there's an opportunity cost of what it might have been able to use for other things in the future, but it is not being reallocated from anything else. Okay, and uh, all right, great, thank you. Those are the questions that I have. So I think that being the case, uh, we would now be opening this up to public comment. Um, give me one minute here to bring that up. All right, so this is the time for public comment. If any member of the public would wish to provide public comments now, uh, please, if you're in person, there's a card to fill out, a speaker card, please provide that to the city clerk. If any member of the public would like to wish, uh, comment via Zoom, please use the raised hand feature or press star nine if you're connected by audio only if you'd like to provide a public comment. For those who desire to provide public comment on this consideration item, please raise your hand now. As a reminder, each speaker will have two minutes to make your oral remarks. The Zoom feed for each speaker will cut off automatically at two minutes. Written comments submitted at least two hours before the start of the meeting have been posted to the city's website for public review and are included in the meeting record but will not be separately read into the record. And also please note that during consideration items, group spokespersons are allowed 10 minutes in lieu of other members of the group speaking on the item. We trust everyone will follow the rules. And additionally, in-person oral comments will be accepted prior to remote public comments. At this time, 
I'll ask the city clerk if there are members of the public. I see one that is here at the dais now. If you'd like to provide comments, we'll start now. Greetings. My name's Pete Bennett. I'll give you a, a good way to figure out how hard it is to catch these people. Imagine a basketball game with 85 basketballs thrown on the court <laughs> and then try to catch them all. Okay? Cameras work. You got me on camera being beaten up. I still haven't seen the video. And, uh, you know, my comments split with the city of Walnut Creek because I'm very, there's some animosity here that needs to be resolved. You, you worry about $85,000 in losses. If you look at what I've been through and what the potential revenue that I could have made and would have accomplished as a business person, I'm looking at more than $500 million in losses. And nobody seems to take that as important. I have proof of forgery with my family trust, millions. And part of that family trust leads to David Rockefeller, who's my grandfather's client. My other grandfather's client was the Kennedys, and they killed him in 62, and then they assassinated the president. You get some gravity here. And so the other day, Officers recovered my mail, so there's a mail charge theft connected to me now. I'm pretty sure it was stolen up at Trinity Center as well. I have a complicated problem with my identity, some weird stuff going on. It's okay. And so they got my stuff back, and that was great. The office recovered it. And the other night, I'm sitting over at Phil's Coffee, and four gunshots ran out, and I saw the muzzle flash in my glasses. Officers showed up, and they were like, you again? Nobody's restored any of my finances, and I'm out millions of dollars. And retail theft, I had a computer store and a guy with a gun. Thank you. Thank you, I guess is what I can say. By the way, this is broken. I almost fell over, and I'm having trouble walking. And if this had come loose, I'd be on the floor and have needing help to get up because of all the beating. Do we have any other members of the public that are in the chamber now that would like to speak? Please come to the dais. Uh, my name is Joseph Brody, and I'm a, a member of the community. We've lived here, my wife and I, for about the last six years. Uh, and, you know, I feel recently, kind of over that period of six years, there's been a Sort of slow slide in the feeling of public safety that you could say when you live in a place is it safe or not it's sort of a general feeling you're on the street take your kid to the park this kind of thing is is what gives a member of the community a feeling of whether or not the place they're living is getting better or worse and i think you know what this meeting was scheduled for today obviously is sort of a large event but it comes at the end of this slow slide, at least for me, and I think a lot of other people that uh, maybe feel the same way. And you know, I was listening to what's happening today, and obviously there's so much that we can do as a community, and then there's a lot of, we need to reach out to this person, it's a larger problem, there's this other committee, which you know, that's, that's part of any organization, a large organization especially. Um, but I guess what I've left with as a citizen, I feel a sense of urgency that I should do something and a sense of guilt that I haven't done more, you know, and that's why I'm trying to be here today and be more active. But, you know, why is it not the priority to say the crime rate should be going down overall? This is important. We should have the lowest crime rate of any comparable community in the area. You know, what is it that it kind of feels like there's not a belief that this can happen, that this slow slide is somewhat inevitable? that you know, five years ago when I took my kid to Civic Park, it'd be like not a thought of any kind of unsafe behavior. But now, you know, we used to sit outside the library. Now let's go inside the library, you know, because there's a few people here, we're not really sure. You know, that's the thing I think that, you know, as a citizen, as a voter, affects a lot of people. Uh, and I would like to hear how, how that is addressed overall instead of this specific instance. Thank you very much. 
And just to remind anybody in the audience, too, that following public comment, any members of the uh, City Council can ask further questions of our staff, to re regarding either our own thoughts or any questions that come up from the public as well. So uh, let's go to Zoom, if we don't have anybody else in the chamber here that's ready to speak. We'll bring our first person in. Um, first person is Carrie and Sarah. I still see her on the attendee list. Is we able to bring her in? She's not accepting. What? Um, she's not accepting, so we can go to the next. Okay, person. let's go to the next one. Greg Brumley. For for those that have raised their hand that are on Zoom, please be prepared to come in at a moment's notice. We're trying to go through these as quickly as we can. Yes, we can. Thank you for that. Um, my name is Greg Brumley. I'm in the uh, Northwest Regional Asset Protection Manager for Nordstrom. And I, I just want to say thank you to the council and, uh, and, and to you as well, um, Mayor Wilk and, and Chief Knox for joining us at our, our store right after the event. I wasn't there, but my, uh, my supervisor, Steve Fahey, was. We just want to thank you for the support. Um, Officer Godinez or Sergeant Godinez has been great to work with and, and Brian Vivera on site as well. Just a, a quick question for, for us. Um, we, we, you guys were gracious uh, as a council and, and the department, the police department to make an agreement with us to allow off-duty officers work uh, on site with us, which has been a huge deterrent in these events. We've seen um, that a lot of times these events start with a scout showing up to sort of see what's the situation look like and are we able to, uh, you know, successfully, you know, attack them. And in the case in other locations where we've had law enforcement on site, it's been a great deterrent. So, so we made this agreement with you all. And one of the things we've, we've noticed is that uh, some of the officers have told us that it's, it's difficult for them to sign up for service because they often will be pulled off to do uh, uh, patrol to fill in gaps. When our agreement with you guys was really more about they would get pulled to, to uh, in case there was an emergency or something really uh, catastrophic happening. So we would just ask that, um, that, that maybe uh, you guys consider that piece in the contract to allow uh, more officers to sign up. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a great deal for them on their off duty day to uh, to make a little extra money and not have to uh, you know be out on the on their normal beat to stand right in front of our store, it, it's a good assignment. So that that that's our comments. And again, thank you all for uh, for this uh, this meeting today. It really means a lot to us at Nordstrom. Thanks, Greg. Hold on one sec. We have a question by City Council. Um, thank you, Mr. Brumley, for being here today and for your comments. As I was thinking about um, the officer, and you know, how it would have deterred. And you have three doors, one on the north, actually you have four doors, one on the north, one on the south, and two on the west side, basically across from P.F. Chang's and Sur La Top. What are you looking at in terms of hardening that more porous nature of the store sitting right out on that corner? Are you considering locking the, nor the uh, north door? Yeah, that, that door, that north door on, on uh, I think it's north, the Diablo uh, right. door, uh, Diablo Boulevard, uh, we're closing down that at night. And, and what, when we do have the officers showing up, they, they stand right on those, I believe it's the north entrances there on that, that street that now is shut off. That's the most accessible um, uh, for us in the past, the most effective location for, for those off-duty officers to stand. So, so that's where we've had them. And when they do come, that's where they stay. Unfortunately, the night of the event, we didn't have anybody signed up to uh, to work off duty for us, so uh, we were kind of, you know, so are left you saying standing that, without coverage. Are you saying that on November twentieth, the north door was locked? The door. No, 
Um, it, it was not. Okay, uh, but it will be in done the future. That since. Okay, thank you. I, that was one of the yep. hardening tactics that yep. I was hoping you were going to affirm. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Brumley. Thank okay. you. Next speaker, Susan White. Now I'm unmuted. Yep. I'm a Rossmore resident, and uh, you just addressed one of my questions, which was, why don't you recommend locking all of the doors but one so that people get one entrance? They can always exit, but they can't always enter. Uh, and I also am concerned about the parking lot, about what would happen if uh, these people decided to storm the parking lot, the parking garage, which would be a pretty exciting moment in history. Um, are you considering anything like that? Because my friends and I, we've talked about being in the parking garage and suddenly having a bunch of cars just flying through there to get to entrances to the different stores in the Broadway Plaza. Thank you. Next speaker, Tim Smith. Good morning, Tim Smith here. Can you hear me fine? Yep. Yes, we can. Uh, great, I appreciate it. Uh, my wife and I have been residents of Walnut Creek for about four years now. And I just wanted to say a couple of things. First, I really appreciate what you all are doing, the, the city council, the mayor, as well as the police department to address this issue. I think it's fairly significant. I think it's you know overall you know showing more and more decay in our society. So I really appreciate that. Um, and we both support using any funds necessary to try to uh, prevent or at least curb some of these mob crimes that are that are starting to happen. So we would support that also. Uh, I do have a couple of questions on it, and it was really neat to hear the the uh, the gentleman from Nordstrom on. But uh, the two questions I have is um, what you know, what responsibilities do our businesses also have to provide security to try to prevent or deter theft of their uh, of their property? Uh, I know back in, back out, in the right day. At, hold on, one, you cut out right at the good part. <laughs> uh, could you repeat that last sentence? Yeah, certainly. I was wondering what responsibility the individual businesses have also to protect the property that they own in their stores. You know, back in the day, uh, I can remember, you know, armed security guards, private security or or company security guards that would prevent retail theft. And, and I know there's liabilities against that and everything else now, but I think a you know, a two-tiered approach where, you know, Walnut Creek Police Department is providing security, obviously, as one line of defense, but also the businesses. So that's one question. And the second question is, what can we as citizens do to help? And I'm not talking about vigilantes or anything else, but, you know, I've seen posts of people being aware of, you know, cars running through with no license plates and everything else, and that's great. But is there anything else that we as uh, citizens of Walnut Creek can do to to help uh, help our town also. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Next speaker is Noel. Noel K. Hello, uh, my name is Noel Coates, and I'm an 18-year resident of downtown Walnut Creek. Um, I'm a little bit dismayed at this meeting because I felt like there was a lot of uh, beating around the bush and not solutions-based thinking. The city has a problem with leadership, policing, and operations, including budgeting for at least 10 years. This recent incident, which went global news is the culmination of many institutional failings, unfortunately. In 2013, there was the Tiffany store, smash and grab, no arrests. 2018, the Apple store, smash and grab, $30,000 worth of merchandise. 
So this is not a new thing. Broadway Plaza and downtown area are clearly the locus of retail theft and frankly, other types of violence, such as gun violence. We need cops literally walking the beat on foot physically in the area of downtown nightly. I truly question the additional traffic cameras and drones in this proposal. Per the city's biennial budget on your website, in fiscal year 2020, the WCPD acquired six portable cameras with property crime for property crime investigation to use in conjunction with late bait vehicles. Where were they during the Nordstrom robbery? Casual discussion of coordinated attacks on Walnut Creek on various social media are not uncommon. The high-end retail here is seen as a free for all, unfortunately. We should need to be encouraging Walnut Creek to be a poor choice for outside opportunistic criminals via investigations and prosecutions. Broadway and downtown are assets to those of us who live and work here, and we need to protect. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Amy. Amy, if you're there, go ahead. Hi, sorry. I am. <laughs> this is Amy Majori. Um, I'm an almost 15 year resident of Walnut Creek. I have two kids in the public school system, both a middle schooler and an elementary schooler. Um, and I've also been in the, working in the nonprofit field for the last um, 15 years, um, supporting nonprofits in the Contra Costa area, as well as um, residents helping people in Walnut Creek. And I'm calling in today because I want to make sure that um, this was a great meeting. I love to see the community effort and the collaboration among the city, um, the sheriff, the, all the different participation. So it's actually, when it was, I was very interesting learning about all the different areas of what's involved. Um, but I want us to be careful. I do not personally believe that the funds, the $2 million from this um, emergency stat the, from the COVID funds should be used for this purpose. I think there's, as you saw some other ideas, the sheriff saying that they could loan somebody all these, you know, other ways of dealing with it. I think there's other ways of um, serving this issue. Um, $2 million out of the 8 million is a lot of money. That's 24%. And there are a lot of other things that can be done with that money. Um, if you look at the categories of eligible uses of funds, it's for the public health emergency. It can help workers who are responding to essential work during the COVID crisis, um, both public employees as well as providing grants to eligible employers that have eligible workers who are performing essential work. There are so many other ways that this two million can be used. Um, I challenge the <laughs> city council to ask for what are the salaries of the nonprofit workers that are serving your residents? I would say you would be shocked about how low salaries are. And that's just one area. This can also be used for more mental health services. This can also be used for preventative message, measures. Um, this crime occurred and, um, and we don't know the reasons exactly, but low income, poverty, all these other issues could be part of it. So. I feel that this two million can be better served in a different area. Thank you, Amy. Next speaker is Brian Hirahara. Uh, good morning, Brian Hirahara Beach Development, and also apologize for the delay. Uh, President of Walnut Creek Downtown. 
I just want to uh, commend the, the police department as well as the council for taking this so seriously on pretty short notice. I'd be there, but uh, I had a conflict. Um, and just say that I agree with the, or I, I disagree with some of the other comments that were made. Um, we happen to own the building where Tiffany's housed and, you know, that incident, I mean, you can't predict that someone's going to ram a building at two o'clock in the morning or whatever it was. And this current situation is, is such a, uh, anomaly, um, that's happening nationwide. It's not just Walnut Creek. So, um, I, again, I commend you for doing, taking this very seriously. It is a serious issue for our downtown, but I also want to point out that in, in a certain sense, we're a victim of our own success. Um, as the chief mentioned, we have so many, so much activity going here and shopping and dining that we become prey for people that are just doing bad things. Um, I also just want to express that the downtown association is uh, there as a partner as always, and we'll do everything possible to participate in this effort and partner with the city and support as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Mayor, I don't see any, Mayor, I don't see any additional hands raised on. Okay, this. yep, I, I see that uh, Kathy Hemingway is in the back, so why don't you come on up now, and if there's anybody else that wishes to speak in person, please come up now. Good morning, Mayor Wilk and uh, City Council members. My name is Kathy Hemingway. I'm the Executive Director of Walnut Creek Downtown's Business Association. Um, I too would like to echo Brian's comments about thanking um, the Council for taking today's action and, and working with um, especially um, City um, staff with the um, Nordstrom team. I know that they were very affected um, during about the incident that occurred on the 20th and um, we appreciate that support. I did also want to um, express the support of um, Walnut Creek downtown for the officers and the additional um, $2 million um, dollar expenditure to um, support additional officers within the downtown. We've been talking to um, council as well as um, the police department over the last year and a half, two years, that this is something that um, our businesses would um, really like to see happen. Um, their support, the physical um, presence and uh, having um, more communication, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one opportunities for our business owners with the police department um, presence downtown. So thank you very much for that consideration and I appreciate your support um, of our businesses. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Do we have any more on Zoom or here? Okay. Well, we'll close public comment then and bring it back to council. And uh, what we'll do at this point point is any further, well, the first thing we'll do actually is ask our uh, city manager or chief any questions or our own thoughts regarding any of the public comments that came in. So I see Councilmember Silva's finger is on the button. So we'll start with Councilmember Silva. Thank you very much. Um, we did have some comments about something of a gradual decline. Member, if, I'm, if I may, um, I believe uh, Councilmember Francois is on Zoom as well too, so I didn't know if the council wanted oh. to provide an opportunity for him to provide comments before the council started its deliberations. Uh, we're actually not deliberating quite yet, but yes, that, that's a good point. I didn't see his hand up, so I wasn't sure if he was on, but if council member Francois is on still, oh, now I see his hand, let's bring him in. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. We can. Thanks, Matt. Okay. I'm sorry I can't be there in person for this very important meeting. Um, I have read all the correspondence that's been submitted. I've watched the entire proceeding so far and heard all your careful uh, questions and communications as well as the comments from the public. So thank you for that. And, and thank you to the chief and to the city manager and to our entire city staff for treating this incident as seriously as they have and for calling this special meeting within 10 days um, from the occurrence. I, I think it's appropriate that we've done that and I appreciate the effort that has gone into this so far. I had, if I were there in person, I would a few questions that I would uh, ask of the police and perhaps of the DA is to, um, 
I'm interested in the additional efforts that would be made for further investigations and how likely those are, are will result in additional arrests. Uh, we, we understand there's been 30 or three so far, but that far more than three people participated in this. So if there was a further explanation of the investigatory process and how likely that would uh, be to lead to additional uh, arrests, I'd be interested in that. And then also a, maybe a question for the, the chief about um, what, what efforts are we, we doing to be aware of what's happening nationally and regionally? It seems that sometimes these incidents are tied to high profile verdicts and cases and somewhere else in the country, or in this particular instance, there was a high profile theft in San Francisco the day before Walnut Creek was targeted. So are, are we being alert to those sort of situations and kind of harding uh, our particular targets. And then just in terms of comments, and I know I'm sharing probably comments that you all have, I have zero tolerance for any type of criminal activity in our town, especially one as brazen and as organized as this. And I think we need to make sure that we take all efforts to ensure that those who are, who are involved in this are caught and prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And that we also make sure that our police department have all the resources they need to respond and take necessary steps to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, I, I do all, also want to add hopefully some, some comfort to the public that we treat this very seriously and this is unacceptable and won't be tolerated in Walnut Creek. But I also will be shopping downtown with my family this holiday season as I do every year, because I have confidence in our police department and the efforts that have been made to keep us safe. That said, I, I, we can't be complacent and we can't underreact to this incident. And so if I were there in, port, in person, I would strongly support the resolution and I appreciate um, the seriousness that, that my colleagues and the chief and the city manager have given to this situation and um, look forward to continuing to, to work with all of you on this. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Okay. So, uh, so let's, if there's any, uh, uh, anything that we would like to address based upon comments that we heard, Let's do that now. We'll start with Council Member Silva. Thank you very much. Um, we had one comment, Chief, that related to a general slow slide, uh, slide in um, safety in our community. And while we're not here today to talk about that, we're here to take today to talk about an organized um, crime spree. I think it would be interesting for us as a city to be able to hear the latest details on our crime rates. I'm not asking for it today, but also it's very difficult. We're a community of 70,000 people, but we're a daytime community of nearing 150,000. So we don't get compared to a suburb of 70,000 people in the same, or 40,000 or 45,000 such as Danville. Uh, you have to extrapolate and really be sure you're comparing the correct things. But perhaps um, early in January or February, we can get the latest data on crime over time. Um, and I also want to be cautious that we don't interpret people that look scary as being criminals. <laughs> and that's also, uh, you know, how we have to consider that. Um, there was another question. Um, no, actually, there were no other questions I think we need to address. So, okay. um, I had a couple of questions that I, I quickly wanted to address. So let me first ask if Councilmember Darlinger has. Okay, so um, one of the things I think that we can quickly talk about, though, is there had been some high profile crimes that happened in the past few months that we discussed how police officers could be allocated on the streets, especially weekend nights. So, uh, Perhaps, Chief, if you can give us an idea, prior to November 20th, what are some of the actions that the police have taken over the previous few months to address some of those more high-profile instances of uh, crime that we had seen? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So one of the things we do is we do pay attention to uh, national media and incidents that are occurring uh, across the nation, whether it's uh, 
election related, uh, you know, a jury verdict and a, and a case that everybody is following. You know, we are in the heart of California and there's a lot of, uh, you know, tragedies that have occurred here that, uh, that people have taken an interest in over the, the, the last several decades. Um, sometimes that is uh, related to public safety. So, uh, and, and with the population being what it is and Walnut Creek being such a destination city, uh, we constantly have those issues on our radar. So we try to be very calculated on when we need to bring in extra resources and prepare for potential, um, you know, demonstrations. Uh, sometimes we get prior warning of that. Sometimes we don't. Um, the, and somebody had mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, employee wellness. The last thing we want to do is burn our officers out with just working overtime after overtime. But so we try to we try to be measured, but we also try to plan uh, accordingly to bring staffing in when it is necessary. Thank you. Um, there was also a question that we heard um, from Nordstrom uh, specifically about pulling in uh, pulling in officers that had signed up to fill gaps. Uh, I'm not looking for an answer for this unless you have one. I, I do. Okay, great. So, um, and I, I, I need to do a little more research to find out exactly because I think there may have been um, a misinterpretation of our contract. So our contract with Nordstrom, Nordstrom clearly states that we will provide uh, the staffing if, um, if it's available and if an officer signs up for it. I don't know of any occurrence um, where an officer was pulled from that assignment that had already signed up. I think what the gentleman was talking about was maybe just in passing officers mentioning that they uh, were, were allocated somewhere else prior to them being able to sign up. But um, if they're pulled away from that assignment uh, when they're at Nordstrom and they're gone for more than 50% of the time, then we don't bill them for the, those hours. I don't know if that has occurred. Um, I think what's more, uh, more probable is that the officer was probably just talking about not signing up for the overtime in the first place because they were allocated somewhere else. Okay. Um, thank you. Another question came up regarding blocking garage parking lots. I'm not sure the feasibility of that, but I just thought I'd see if you had a comment on that. Or maybe in addition, the comment that are, should we be worried about parking in the parking garage that the mob would go into the parking garage to get to the stores? It's, it's certainly a concern, um, but, you know, we try to be measured in every approach we take. There's a parking garage, you're limited on, on your entry points and your exit points, so putting a barricade up anywhere just would be impractical. Uh, I would say if that's where your car is, uh, it's a piece of property. If there's a mob there, leave the garage, get to safety. You can get your car later. Okay, thank you. Um, the uh, do I, I believe I've seen them, but do some of these higher end stores have their own private security guards? Yes, I don't know which stores in particular have hired security. I know Nordstrom is one of them. Um, but to the the loss prevention agent who we heard from, I before I became a cop, I was a loss prevention agent. It's a dangerous job, and a criminal is more likely to challenge a loss prevention agent or a security guard, especially if they're unarmed, as opposed to tangling with a police officer who has you know, far more experience and far more tools at their disposal. So you do see more violence uh, towards uh, loss prevention agents and security guards as opposed to police officers. So I do believe there is a difference. There's probably a greater deterrence of having a police officer in uniform there as opposed to a security guard, but uh, you know, security is better than nothing. Okay, great. A couple of qu uh, quick more questions. If you have to run off, we'll, we'll dismiss this and then we'll call a break. Okay. Um, we heard from Councilmember Francois. He'd like to uh, find out a little bit more information r regarding additional efforts for th further investigations for arrests. Yes, it's a great question. We do have several leads on identifying other offenders, um, but that's all I can really say at this time because I don't want to jeopardize the investigation. But we are following up on several leads, and I do anticipate additional arrests in the coming weeks. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sure, everybody appreciates hearing that. And what effects? Uh, well, you talked about uh, following some of the effects nationally and regionally regarding the verdicts. Uh, are we staying on top of those if there are high-profile court cases? 
Yeah, so <clears throat> as earlier I mentioned that I had a phone call and I've been working with uh, Mike Cena, the ex executive uh, director of NICRIC. So one of the things we're looking at is one, sharing intelligence uh, quicker uh, and, and developing a, a, a more robust network to share intelligence real time. In relation to some of the national events that go on, uh, one of the notes I had made a couple of weeks ago, well, just on the heels of, of Nordstrom, was are we doing a regional analysis on when, uh, when these you know, mob-style uh, robberies or burglaries occur? Um, are, they, are they in response to something nationally? Um, in 2020, we saw that very clearly with George Floyd and with uh, the election cycle, so a lot of us were prepared for that. Um, some of these other cases, um, there's one just recently where we really didn't see any response to it, and, and it could have been because of the verdict came out the way that it did, uh, but it's something that we certainly pay attention to, but, and, and that's a conversation that I'm gonna have at our next chief's meeting and uh, with uh, Mike Cena is, are we doing a regional analysis or a national analysis on the response to some of these uh, events that garner so much media attention. So it, it's definitely on my radar. Great, thank you. And uh, the last question I have came from one of our, um, one of the people that had called in via Zoom, and I think it's a, a good question, and I think it deserves a, uh, a good answer here as well, is what can citizens do to help? Because I don't believe we want armed vigilantes on the street on this one. So what can citizens do, reasonably speaking, that can help us potentially deter and, uh, and, and ensure the safety of everybody? Yeah, so safety is paramount. My number one concern is that we don't have anybody get injured, uh, and we certainly don't want vigilantes. I know that some people uh, do want to do something and feel like that they they need to take matters into their own hands or to have an active role if they see a crime in progress. And while I appreciate that, uh, we are hiring. We'll send you to the police academy and get you on as an officer. <laughs> but uh, uh, the ultimate goal is to keep everybody safe. So if you see something, say something. I think a lot of people are apprehensive to call the police because they don't want to bother us or they're not sure if their instinct is right. Trust your instincts. If you, th if you see something suspicious, especially if it looks like a group of people that may be you know, casing a business or, or scouting a business, please call the police department and give us as much information as you can. If you do see a crime in progress, just be a good witness. If, if you feel safe trying to video it or taking a photo of a license plate, that's awesome, that's great, that will be very helpful, but your safety is paramount. So let me give you the opportunity to make a 30 second PSA on this. When should people call 911 and when should they just call the Walnut Creek Police Department non-emergency hotline? Well, admittedly, in the heat of the moment, most people probably don't have the business number handy to the Walnut Creek Police Department. Maybe you'll Google it if you're really good with your smartphone and you can touch the number and call into the business line. But when in doubt, if it's a crime in progress and you feel it's an emergency, call 911. Great, thank you. See something, say something. All right, uh, we're gonna take a 10 minute break and then we're gonna wrap it up. So we'll see you in 10.
right, we'll bring it back to council now, and any last comments prior to uh, the, dis the consideration item. And let's start, uh, well, we've been starting all day with this, so I apologize, Cindy, but we'll start with you again uh, <laughs> regarding the, uh, any, any final comments, uh, discussion points regarding the consideration item. So you're looking for um, Oh. Are you looking for questions or are you looking well, for... Well, if there's any questions that we have, I think we've asked all the questions, but if any further questions came up, we could certainly ask them. But now it's more about just comments in general about our thoughts on the consideration items that we've been discussing to date. And do we want to tackle all three at once or are we... Uh, yeah, sure. You'd like okay. to tackle all three at once. We'll get the okay. comments on there and then we'll move forward. All right. Um, I, like the rest of us, this has been a very disturbing and very disconcerting thing that happened here in Walnut Creek, and I think it's very important that we send a very strong message that this is unacceptable and that we are going to do the best we can with the resources at hand to prevent future instances and that whether that is um, strong enforcement of current laws, um, deterring, hardening, um, and in that regard, the actions here today, I'm very supportive of them. Um, I think the, the suite of actions, including the additional financing, working with our legislative partners, um, can help us achieve that goal of preventing this in the future, as well as dealing with making people feel safe in Walnut Creek, because that is the most important thing, is in our mission is to make sure that the people who live here, work here, and play here feel safe. Thank you. All right, Council Member Haskew. We live in a world where everybody is used, used to the or, um, TV procedurals, where in a neat wrap up in one hour, everything is all the bad guys go to jail and the good guys somehow resist every bullet shot at them, um, but their aim is nearly perfect. That, that doesn't actually rec reconcile with the real world. This is, this is a long, drawn-out process, and it is very important that um, we remember that when we were struggling over to do body cameras, and we were worried about the cost and what they would do, and we voted to support it, and we were right to have done that. That has come in as so many, um, in many cases, as the um, deciding factor. So I think that we really have to acknowledge that technology is to be embraced, and we need to find as many ways to use technology. I agree with my fellow council members. Cindy's darling was the one to have said it. Um, first because she was picked first, um, but other people judge everything by our downtown and what happens in our downtown, and it reflects on our whole community. Therefore, I think it is very important that we focus on downtown because it affects so much of everything that is going on around it. Unfortunately, Walnut Creek was the first non, every, let me start that sentence again. San Francisco had an issue. San Francisco's had an organized retail issue for a really long time. CVS and a lot of the other drugstores were pulling out because of their um, issues uh, with theft. Walnut Creek was the first non-metropolis pretty much everywhere where we had a really important store and it was a really big activity. So we got international coverage. In the meantime, there have been, I guess, 10 to 15 or more incidents in just our Bay Area, which is the same um, modus operandi and the same way to communicate and, and all that sort of stuff. So. We are reacting very strongly, but we weren't the first, and we, we were the first, and we hope to be, um, for us, the last of this experience. So um, I, I am going to say that when all is said and done, uh, with 
the changes that council member Silva added to the letters that are going out. Um, I appreciate that, that they were, they needed to be done. I appreciate uh, that we have received it. I think the most telling information was how little could be done in a situation that the po police were presented and how much they did get done given what they had to work with. And then I also think that at this point it is the right time to bite the bullet and have a beat solely for downtown, particularly focused on those hours where most of our downtown um, issues have developed which means they're probably noon to midnight. But, but um, that's just my opinion and my thing. It's up to the um, able chief and his, and his staff to figure out when best to use it. But I think we need to protect our downtown specifically. Great, thank you. Council Member Silva. Thank you very much. And thank you to my colleagues for your comments and your thoughtful questions and to the public for your comments and your questions and your feedback and differing points of view. I also want to say thank you to our entire city staff from Public Works, Finance Division, HR, because it takes a team or a village of all of our departments to be able to come up with strategies to manage this situation. And I particularly want to thank the police department. I will talk first or say first, for the night it happened and what those 11 people did rapidly. To arrest three is amazing. I have three granddaughters. Four adults can't corral three granddaughters that are under the age of six. So I don't know how you managed to do that. Thank goodness you are professional, you are trained, you know how to do your job, your instincts are trained to be good and respond. And I appreciate all of the um, recommendations here in the thoughtful way that this came together as quickly as it did. Bottom line, um, crime cannot be tolerated. It is not acceptable. There is not a level of crime that is okay. But in particular, organized crime, planned, decided upon, targeting people, is egregious and particularly unacceptable. And I'm hoping that our state laws actually allow us to treat every person involved in an organized activity as such as if they were felons, whether they grabbed a toothbrush or were just driving a car. Because if you cannot stop this with appropriate laws, everything else you're doing later on is going to be just impossible. But it's not just about the dollar value or the crime for me. This is about our local quality of life and our local economy. If we allow Broadway Plaza and our downtown to become this random target, which it would be random, it won't be every Saturday night, it will be random, it'll be slot machine, then we will not be able to sustain our local economy, we will not have good jobs, we will not have visitors, we will not have tax revenues, and our quality of life will deteriorate very, very rapidly. So I am fully in favor of the recommendations that have been made here today with the additional, the expansion of our police department staff for the 18 months for the overtime. Please check out whether we can borrow some officers on a preventive basis, not just on a rapid mutual aid for when things go wrong. And um, also for the, the drone use and the technology to enhance, to maintain and enhance the cameras that we have. I'm fully supportive and um, I'm glad that because of the American Recovery Act funding, we are able to have those dollars at our fingertips because otherwise this would be very, very, very tragic. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And uh, thank you um, to my council colleagues for your comments. I agree with all of them and, uh, re and realize it, that we can't just sit idly by and go, well, we'll try to do better next time. Uh, so first, on that note, I want to thank the police department. Uh, your response to this uh, was exemplary, and, uh, the res and the current response that we've seen just in the past 10 days since immediately moved to action. So thank you 
to the police department as a whole for all that you do and getting the word out there quickly. Uh, we all depend upon that for safety. And as well as the public works, appreciate everything that you're doing there and helping ensure that that part of whether it's barricading or anything else is also immediately able to help protect the safety of downtown because those kind of detours and anything else that we're doing when it comes to the public works is really important. Uh, and, and these are outrageous brazen attacks. Uh, yes, in our stores, of course, but also on our welfare uh, and our sense of well-being and the safety of the community, which includes residents and visitors and employees and, and shoppers. But Walnut Creek can't handle this alone, uh, and no city can. We need to provide the first line of safety and deterrence, but we also need the coordination and the collaboration with all the offices of criminal justice. And those are some of the discussion points that we had and the questions that we had for the sheriff's office and the DA. The sheriff, the DA, and our own police department are, are tasked with keeping the public safe. We need a fully functioning public safety apparatus to preserve everybody's rights and keep the people safe from crime. What happened with the release of one or two of the suspects was a breakdown of our public safety system in some manner, and, and that needs to be resolved for the future. Uh, we need our, our partners in the criminal justice system to do their parts. We need to arrest, charge, and prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. The community expects us to keep them safe from violent criminal behavior. As Councilmember Silva said, no crime is tolerable. That is a zero tolerance policy. I wish we could spend these kinds of funds elsewhere. I really do. We always, uh, you know, when we think about our home budget, we wish that we could spend them in certain areas other than perhaps an alarm system. But this is the, this is the fire, so to speak, that we need to put out. We need to ensure that we keep the community safe and that we provide the greatest deterrence possible from the city of Walnut Creek through our police department and other measures. We need to do everything in our power to ensure that this is the case. And I appreciate, uh, as well as Councilmember Francois's uh, comments that he made regarding zero tolerance and his support as well. And with that, I'll ask for a motion. I move to authorize and send the revised letters as recommended at the dais to our two assembly members, our state senator, the governor's office, and also to Attorney General Robert Bonta's office. And I also um, move to adopt the resolution that is attached, which will allocate the funding from the American Rescue Plan for public safety as prescribed. And I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. And if I can ask the city clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Silva. Aye. Council Member Darling. Aye. Council Member Haskew. Aye. Mayor Wilk. Aye. Motion carries four to zero. All right, we have unanimous on that. We look forward to the police department and city management helping to keep us safe and through the holiday season. And with that, we will adjourn our special meeting of the city council. Thank you. <laughs>